you know, and I, so I have opinions just like everyone else has opinions, but my, I, I keep them to myself cause I know they're only opinions. Uh-huh. I think some people have to realize that there's a difference between facts and opinions and you can have all the opinions you want, but they're only yours. They're not the truth. They're not the rule and they're not, you know, everyone else doesn't have to agree with you. Um, yeah, that's me. My two well- cents. But no, and especially when you get to something as subjective as music in the first place, like, but Mm -hmm. also it's the thing of, you know, it's all, I mean, whatever, I only clicked on one, but, um, and I don't remember his screen name, so I'm not going to out anybody here, but it's like a dude who doesn't even have a video of himself playing drums so that you can check his claim that he, you know, (laughs) it's like, I could do that in my sleep or whatever. Like, okay, man. Hello, hiya folks, how you doing? Thanks for being here. Best buddies, what you been up to? It's been a couple of weeks. Every time I do this, it's been a couple of weeks lately, the the past few months. Uh, How are you, friends? If you're here for the first time, my name is Ryan. Uh, This is my show, Hitmakers. Uh, This is our last episode of 2020. An interesting year to say the least. So um, the last few episodes I've been consciously not saying my name because my name is Ryan Brown. My birth name is Ryan Brown. And um, I was named after a pub band called Ryan's Fancy, who I think the guy's from Ireland. Uh, I live in Atlanta, Canada. They were like a band that that traveled around here. Um, I guess it's a little bit before my time, but my mom liked the name. And little did she know that it was just like a big year for Ryan's. So, I, you know, every year in school, I'd be one of like three Ryan's in my class. And the Browns are like, it's like a huge thing too. I come from a big Catholic family. So I always have kind of felt like both like neither of those names are really my own. Like Ryan is like, like it's too common. I even asked, I was at a party uh, earlier this year. And uh, I introduced myself. Somebody's like, hey, what's your name? Uh, this lady's like, um, it's the weird thing of the, the like, youthification of our culture, right? Like, I'm, I'm too old to be like this girl says. But anyway, she's like, I was like, my name's Ryan. She's like, oh, do you have a nickname or something? Like, I can't do Ryan. And I get it. So I feel like, you know, it's like my name is like too, too bland for showbiz. And it's not, it's not my parents' fault. It's just kind of the way things shook out. That being said, there is a guy named Ryan Brown who's a soap opera star who wrote a book called Thought Out and Fed Up. And it's about John Wayne's frozen corpse coming back to life and these people stumble into... It reminded me a little bit of The Walking Dead, but it's like they stumble into a town. It's not zombies, but it's like a weird town that's like like the Old West. But perhaps more relevantly to this show, there's also a guy named Ryan Brown who plays the drums for Dweezil Zappa. So it is out there. People do it. I saw my, my friend Jason sent me an Instagram thing recently about there's a DJ in Boston, DJ Ryan Brown. So anyhow... Um, I play the drums. I've been playing the drums since I was a little kid. Uh, This podcast started sort of as a result, not directly of my band splitting up, but I was in an indie band for about 10 years. We were called Glory Glory out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. We were originally called Glory Glory Man United. We've got stuff online. It's not on the streaming services right now because it ran out and I had to change my subscription and I haven't bothered re-uploading it. Um... But we had some success. We toured. We, we got to go to Europe a few times. We, you know, recorded in New York. Um, but we always thought that it would eventually be a full-time thing, but it didn't really work out that way. You know, I kind of fell into a job teaching drum lessons. And uh, this is all explained in the first episode of the podcast, but I think I took it down because I w- like worried it made me not look cool. Anyway, um, 
I uh, was was kind of teaching freelance, gigging freelance around uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I was living. And uh, I had a week where a bunch of students canceled on me. I was like, I should start teaching online. And, you know, I tried to, but one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Um, and I started a podcast, uh, which initially was like purely a way for me to advertise myself as a drum teacher so I could make like a quick buck. Or that was my idea anyway. But it turned into something more interesting. This has been quite an interesting year for the show. I didn't know I'd be doing this right now. I mean, think about that. Last, this time last year, I had just finished. I was playing uh, drums in a show at this the school where I where I work at a performing arts school. I you know teach music lessons and do kind of organizational stuff. It's cool. It's in this like big old weird old like probably haunted church building from the 1800s. But uh, anyhow, we did a show called World War II Radio Christmas, so I played drums in that. It was like a swing kind of like 1940s, well, World War II, right? Uh, I got to play Sing, 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 which was a first. I got, I got to cross that one off the bucket list. Uh, the group, local group called Port City Five, it was, um, they were really great. Yeah, a bunch of classical musicians. It was a cool experience. But also that same month, I was, uh, I was recording drums for my brother's album. He's got, my brother Micah, he's got a new record coming out under the name Palia. He also edits the podcast. I had done uh, a show playing guitar with my friend Jason Ogden, who was actually the guest on the first show of this season. And I uh, was getting ready for a gig where I was playing guitar and keys and singing backup vocals with my friend's disco band, Go Go Disco. And on top of that, I had also started my own uh, song a day uh, project where I was just like writing anything. I guess it would have just started because I, I started on Friday the 13th of December and today's uh, December 14th. So a year and one day ago, uh, I started that and I did it for 68 days. It's on Bandcamp under the name Beach Chair if you're interested. One of the songs, probably the best, the most single-like one, uh, I actually just re-released this year under my new band name, Sunny Side Uppers, and it was filmed at the place where I work, um, although you might not know that from watching the video. And then coronavirus. So like, there was no way I was going to throw a podcast on top of all of that, but in March, everything got shut down. And, uh, you know, at first everybody was thrown for a loop. But I had this idea to do, like, because I've done two seasons of this show. But always in person. I'd recorded these things in person. I didn't know how to do them remotely. I had an idea to do, like, a late night live stream show. So that's what I started doing. We did a few episodes of those. And then the fourth week of the show, I didn't have a guest lined up anyway, but uh, was George Floyd. And uh, I mean, it just felt like time for me to shut up and listen. So that is what I did. I did, um, if you look on the Learn Drums Facebook page, I did play and sing a song that I wrote that night. And I deliberately put it there because only people who follow the page would see it. And there's only about a hundred of them and it's all people I know. So I took some time off, but I did have a couple audio episodes banked and in my inbox had been sitting an email from uh, a publicist uh, from California who had pitched me uh, a couple of drummers like during the off season when I wasn't really doing them and I was like, I don't know how to do them remotely. Uh, I can't go to any of these tour dates. Uh, one of them was Isaiah Skill who plays with Black Flag. So I was like, man, if I ever start the show back up, I want to talk to that guy. Anyway, I did. Um, everybody in the world learned to use Zoom. Uh, when we got shut down, shouts out to Zoom. Um, there's actually two different companies called Zoom, and I do use both. Uh, any, anyhow, so Isaiah, uh, when I talked to him, he, he recommended me this album that Brendan Buckley played on. Uh, the album is called Individual, the artist is Fulano, and um, I posted it on Instagram, and I tagged Mr. Brendan Buckley in it. And he reposted it, and I was like, whoa! I couldn't believe it. Um, but I knew my friend Palmer had met him, 
Uh, Palmer Jameson, my former bandmate, we used to play in the band Valerie Shoegaze Band out of Halifax. And Palmer was doing audio work on the YouTube show Drummer to Drummer. Uh, so anyway, I figured uh, if I ever had an in with this dude, this was it. So I reached out. To my, to my surprise, he agreed to do the show. So here we are. Now you know my story. Today we're talking to Mr. Brennan Buckley. This is our final episode of the year of our Lord, 2020. Um, it's been quite a surprising year. It's all been done remotely. It's the first time I've ever done that. But the cool thing about it is that I can talk to anybody in the world from my living room. Um, so this was a really cool one. He was super generous with his time. I was really nervous. You know, you flip the, the camera on and you're like, whoa, that's the dude. Uh, the guy I know from those pictures and videos. Um, if you're a longtime listener, I think you're really going to enjoy this. If you're new to the show, uh, I sincerely hope you enjoy it. I think you will. It's a good one. Uh, if you're not familiar with him as a player, you may be familiar with some of the artists that he plays with. He is best known for playing with people like Shakira, Harry Farrell of Jane's Addiction. Um, Tegan and Sarah here in Canada, he was in Halifax playing with them. And since it's my show, I'm going to plug my music right next to all of those people. Um, my, my solo project, Sunny Side Uppers, has new music coming out next week as part of Demo Fest. It's a fundraiser for an organization called Solidarity Across Borders, organized by a bunch of punks from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, 180 plus people have submitted demos for this thing. So it's four songs, kind of a lot of first takes on my part. It's a pretty eclectic listen, my, my contribution. And uh, a lot of it was done during the hours, like between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. The, the day that it was due. Um, so there are some things I would change. They are definitely demos, but on the whole, I'm pr I'm pretty pleased with it. I'm 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 pretty proud of the work. I've been counting it down on my uh, my band Instagram, um, but I haven't said what the countdown is for. But as a loyal listener of this show, now you know these are the kind of insider goodies you get. Am I any good? I mean, I'm the real deal. I know that. Um, the music you're hearing in the background is all made by me. If you like it, you may like this other stuff. If you hate it, um, you may still like the other stuff. So to follow along, uh, past episodes, etc., check Learn Drums on Instagram. That's one of my one of my Instagrams. LearnDrums.ca has got all the past episodes. You can find my guest at Brendan Buckley. You should also follow his drummer plus drummer on Instagram. I'm almost out of time here. And honestly, it's about time. You're in for a treat. Here we go. How are you, sir? Thanks for being here. I'm well, and thanks for asking me. Um, how are things in Los Angeles? Ah, they're kind of mellow. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah, as you can imagine, there's a lot of shutdowns, pandemic shutdowns and lockdowns and all this stuff. Um, and they're slowly trying to reopen parts of the city, uh, things like restaurants and uh, stores malls gyms parks but they take like a step forward and then they have to go a step backwards again so it's really hard to kind of predict what's going to happen because every time they try to open up a little bit then they say oh co uh covid19 spiking we gotta pull back a few things right but i don't mind you know california happens to be one of the states that's a little more on the um cautious side compared to mm -hmm. some other states in the united states so I, I don't mind. Yeah. Um, I know it's, it's, um, I mean, obviously it's, it's impacted people's livelihood a lot. I don't, this wasn't necessarily where I intended on starting, but it is kind of like, um, top of mind for everyone. Um, I would it's imagine, <laughs> yes, it is very topical. Um, very 2020. Um, mm -hmm. This, um, so obviously there's no touring right now. Yeah. Uh, I basically spent probably from the age of 
21 till now, just traveling pretty pretty much at least once a month somewhere, like my whole life. Yeah. And I, I haven't left L.A. since February now, and it's the longest I've ever been in one spot as an adult. So it feels really odd. Wild. And I'm getting used to it, but it does definitely is like a whole different lifestyle. Sure. Do you find like, is there something, um, some kind of like circadian rhythm just because I'm like, um, biologically ignorant, let's say, but like some sort of, like, I remember hearing, um, touring musician, a Canadian guy from the band Constantine's talking about how his band toured nonstop for 10 years and then he stopped and, um, he was, he now is like a program director at a campus radio station in Guelph, but he was saying he he just felt weird sitting at his desk and he realizes that his body is used to traveling at a certain speed all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that scientifically if I have that condition, but I definitely uh, I like movement. I like motion. I like changing of environments. I like having lots of things coming up on my schedule and it to be very uh, challenging and different. And I, I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, waking up Monday through Sunday and every day looking exactly the same is a little bit odd for me. That's um, so funny because, um, y so you strike me as somebody who is like very organized and detail oriented. Hmm. So, I am. Well, right. Why would you say that though? What has, um, what has, given you that impression <laughs> i think it's the way that you play um uh -huh. also though um i was showing my my wife uh who you were and i and i showed her a video and she commented that she said uh he wears a watch that means he's organized <laughs> yeah maybe that gives it away too no i am like organized to a fault and like uh it's like my friends like kind of like uh poke fun at me for like how much of like a organizational freak I am, but I'm also a musician. So it, you can mm -hmm. only be so organized and still be a musician. Sure. Uh, I'm not some like neuroscientist or something. Uh, I, uh, I do have, I used to live in Miami. I mm -hmm. lived in Miami for 10 years and I learned how to get up late, stay up really late, you know, go with the flow. It taught me a lot about how to relax and, you know, just have fun. And uh, so I, I strike a balance of being organized enough for me to not lose my my marbles, you know, but also being relaxed enough where I don't drive other people crazy and I and I don't get frustrated by, you know, the everyday chaos of life as a musician. Well, I would think that's um, the most difficult part, but it also sounds to me and it brings to mind, um, I read on somebody's recommendation, uh, Man's Search for Meaning at the start of lockdown, the Victor Franco book. Are you familiar? Just read it this year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, and so he talks about how, you know, our ideal state is not a tensionless state, but it's actually, you know, like striving for something you need, you need like kind of a, a worthy goal. So it sounds like, um, to me, um, if I can psycho psychoanalyze you a little bit within five minutes of meeting you, yeah, <laughs> yeah no big deal. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, I got nothing to do. Um, no, that, that the chaos sort of feeds the, so the, the challenge in that, in that sense would be like to make sense of it. And the, and the joy is in that. But if the, if it's already done for you, then it's like, maybe you go a little crazy. Well, okay. This is a topic that I love. So, um, there, you know, if you could, if you call yourself a perfectionist or mm -hmm. you're one of those kind of people, a lot of us do, that's not really a good thing because life is not perfect. Life will yes. never be perfect. Your day is not going to be perfect. Your year is not going to be perfect. You're going to be, it's just speed bump and, you know, pothole one after another hurdles one after another. So, um, yeah, that Viktor Frankl book, fantastic. The whole idea of logotherapy and not psychoanalyzing your past and all the things that went wrong in your upbringing as much as focusing on having, giving your life meaning, mm -hmm. like having a goal, uh, is fantastic. But also 
you might or might not be hip to the book. Uh, what is it called? It's the um, Jonathan Waitskin skin book. Um, oh. So he's a former chess prodigy. Now he's like a martial artist and uh, and also uh, I don't know con- consultant. Um, I'll I'll get the name of the book for you in a second. But um, he's got a fantastic book. And one of the things he talks about is what really took his chess game to another level. Is you know when you become a young chess prodigy, you just study classical Russian chess and you learn all these moves, every move that anyone ever played, you memorize that. And he said, I'm going to break this mold and I'm going to learn backwards. I'm going to learn from chaos. I'm going to I'm going to mess up this board and, and fight my way out of it. I'm going to do all the wrong moves and then somehow manage to win. And because he's like life is chaos and if you cannot function unless your life is perfect you'll never function you'll never be productive you have to learn yeah you have to learn how to be productive in a chaotic world and and i'm like wow that is actually i read that a while ago and i thought that might be a drawback for me is because i like to wait for things to be perfect before i do something yeah and then you procrastinate because it's never going to be perfect so you have to just say everything's messed up. Let's, let's, let's make something or let's do something. Right. Um, and, um, that it helps you maintain a, like keep a positive attitude too about it. I know I have that, um, issue myself and I'll like hold back and, um, because you're like waiting for an opening or you're waiting for the right time or else it's like, it also is just a control thing, right? Like if you were, you know, I tend to be anxious about, like last night I had trouble sleeping because of all the things I had to do today. And there's nothing I could do about it. The best thing I could do is sleep. Yeah. But um speaking of, I just finished reading the um Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker, that book. I don't know that one. Oh, he's a neuroscientist. I um had listened, I'm not a big Joe Rogan guy, but somebody told me that he had heard like he recommended specifically this episode. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy was on it. But anyway, so he's a sleep researcher at UC Berkeley. And he just wrote a book kind of talking about evolutionarily why sleep exists because it doesn't seem to make sense, right? If Uh you are a creature that needs to survive and eight hours out of the day you were just immobile, like why have we evolved with this? And so describes the research into what it does for you and how much we actually need and what the the effects are of not getting enough and um it's pretty crazy it like it kind of freaked me out at first and i'm somebody who's my sleep patterns have been irregular for most of my life and i tend to like binge and purge is the wrong uh way of putting it but um I wonder now after reading it, if it's like my body doesn't manufacture enough of like the chemical that knocks you out. Mm-hmm. Um, the, Are you a caffeine guy? Um, yeah. Cause I, I also don't sleep great and I make sure now that I cut myself off from all caffeine from, I don't know, maybe like nothing after four thirty PM or something. And it's not like it keeps me up because mm-hmm. I can have an espresso at 10 PM and still pass out, but it's a very, um, you know, restless sleep. Yes. But I, I, I'm fascinated with the topic of sleep too. So I will read this book, Why We Sleep. But because I like nutrition a yeah. lot. I like reading about nutrition a lot. I like fitness a lot. I like reading about fitness and all the different things people learn about what's good for you, what's not good for you. And then like the trifecta of that is sleep. Like yeah. the, the Holy Trilogy. And that is something I've ignored my whole life. I almost prided myself on how I could go for so long without sleeping. And I thought it was like a tough guy thing. Like I yeah. sleep two hours a night and I'm fine. I'll, and, a lot uh, of people I, do. Yeah. And I thought it was like, uh, uh, you know, you can wear it like as a badge of honor. Like look yeah. how productive I am. I can, I can get by with two to four hours of sleep. And I did that my whole 20s and probably half of my 30s. And then I started to read a lot about sleep and, and realizing that I'm probably killing myself <laughs> slowly. Well, it is like one of the things that it does, um, not not to scare you too much, but it flushes out. Um, there is a um, amyloid protein, maybe it's called, but it's it's links to Alzheimer's and it builds up in the brain. And so one of the mm-hmm. things that it does when you sleep is it flushes it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also it's like how your body repairs itself. 
And specifically, too, they talk about the different sleep cycles, like um, non-REM sleep helps convert short-term memories to long-term memories. Um, and it actually empties out the hippocampus in your brain. So it's like short-term memory banks. There are electrical pulses that go through your brain, and that moves it to long-term. Uh, REM sleep is where dreams happen, and they suspect it's uh, like free association. And mm-hmm. it's things like that's how kids learn languages. Mm-hmm. Um, in that it's like you can kind of recognize speech patterns and not and know how they fit together without necessarily knowing like this word means this image and it's used in this context. Um, But also they've done studies where like, if you deprive people of REM sleep for long enough, they'll start hallucinating. Mm -hmm. Because like dreaming, though we don't really understand it, is somehow a necessary function. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, super interesting. I do find the science books kind of a challenge to get through just because it's technical information. I tend to read them at night. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was actually one of my questions because somebody with your schedule, um, in, so I, I am kind of, uh, jumping forward on my own itinerary, but you would have to perform under pressure, um, when you're not always rested, I would think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and that's not really a problem for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I could fly to the other side of the globe, literally fly from here to Beijing or something like that, land and go straight to a sound check and play a concert. And I'm usually pretty fine. And it's not that I'm not tired or it's not that I'm not jet lagged. It's just that I've trained myself to play drums. Uh, well, I've been training myself for so many years that it kind of comes out more naturally than most other things I do in life. Mm -hmm. It might be harder for me to get through customs at the airport than it is to actually get through a concert on stage. Because I think if I sit down on the drum set, I'm like, I know what I'm doing now. I can do this. I can do this with the flu. I can do this when I'm half asleep. I can do this if I'm hungry. Um, But a lot of other things, you know, you, you know, you can't function, you can't think straight. So for the most part, I've, I hardly ever let, I don't want to say fatigue because that's a different type of, uh, you know, being tired, but I, I don't let like lack of sleep or jet lag really get to me when it comes to playing the drums. Uh, mm-hmm. It does affect some other people pretty badly, but uh, for me, I've managed to cope with it at least up until now. Right. Um, are you into uh, like Kenny Werner's effortless mastery idea? Oh, yeah. Well, that that uh, book, man, that book was, I would say, life changing for me. Literally, I uh, he, uh, he came to my college i went to the university of miami music school the conservatory there and he came and gave a clinic and his clinic was maybe 25 percent jazz piano and 75 percent you know just the mental side of music and meditation yeah and he even had this auditorium filled with these 18 to 22 year old jazz snobs all meditating together by the end of the uh, seminar and it was beautiful And when that was over, I was like, I have to get this. I have to tap into this. And um, yeah, anyone who hasn't read that book, they they must get it, the effortless mastery. And then, you know, the whole idea of meditating, but also getting your inner inner monologue together, you know, where it's a positive thing that helps you and uh, not letting the fear of hitting wrong notes or making mistakes stop you from being creative and being Huge. productive. That, that book, I mean, there's a lot of other books that cover that topic too, but that mm. was kind of my introduction to that. And I have it on my bookshelf over there. It probably has passages highlighted still from when I first read it. I still have the CD that, used to, that came with that with the yeah. four meditations on it. Yeah. I had heard about it when I was in school, but I didn't get around to actually reading it until later. And so I have it as an iBook and I downloaded the meditations. But that's something that I found really interesting is that it's um, because I had done, you know, guided meditations for different things just as a way to like um, get into that or whatever, discover it. Um, But the fact that it is built specifically for musicians, I found really Mm -hmm. um, interesting and like kind of specifically addressing the ego and, and those sorts of things. But also, um, 
what reminded me of it was when you're talking about because one of the things he talks about in the book is how when he sits down at the piano he's at his most grounded and that is like a physical connection to a mental space mm-hmm. um, okay i love it so exactly i used to do i don't do it as much i should do this every day but i used to do this when i practiced which was i would come into my practice room the first thing i would do would sit on my drum throne put on my headphones, put on one of the Kenny Werner meditations, put my right hand on my floor tom, open palms, put my left hand on my snare drum, put my feet on the pedals, nice and relaxed. And I would do his meditation, but with my hands touching the drums. And I would listen to him talking. I would breathe when he told me to breathe. I would I would feel the sunlight entering the top of my head and radiating down through my mm-hmm. my feet. And Tripping I would bring down your ribs would, and yep. and yeah, I would just chill out like that. So, you know, if you do this enough times, sitting on the drum set is a relaxing thing and it's a comfortable thing because if you think about it, the drum set is a weird mechanism filled with parts and metal and wood and plastic and you're hitting it and they're all at different distances. They're all different sizes. They're springs. Mm -hmm. It's just a weird contraption. So to get to the point where it feels natural, like a, like a part of your body, an extension of your body takes some time. And I, I didn't know if that was going to help or not. I tried it and I felt like it helped a lot. And then also it helped because I thought that you would never really reach the next level of drumming if you were totally freaked out anytime ever, anyone ever came to see you play. Like if you, were, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you were playing a gig and the second someone walked through the door, you'd be like, oh shit, someone, yeah. someone, someone came in through the, and God forbid it's another drummer. Oh my God, look who's here. So-and-so's here. And then you just shut down anything you can do. Now you're doing it at like a D minus level. So you you have to get to the point where it's like, no matter who's watching, no matter who is, if there's TV cameras or if there's a audio recording happening, or if it's a live television show, maybe like a, SNL. I, I don't know if you know it. It's Saturday Night Live or something. Oh, I've, uh, I'm I'm not familiar. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's it? What's it called? Um, m- what's m- it? There were there were a couple of Canadians on that program. Yeah, I believe. No, I'm, think, I'm thinking of the one with uh, uh, Gene Levy that was like and John Candy. What was that one? Oh, uh, SCTV. SCTV. Yeah. Like yeah. SCTV. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so but you but my point is that you can't function in any of these um you know environments if you don't feel comfortable on the drum set and you don't let outer external forces change the way you perform Mm -hmm. so i think you know that whole idea of meditating and being grounded on your drum set and getting comfortable is all part of the game and you're never going to get to the next level unless you combat that you know and i know people who still have issues with that they're like yeah when 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 i'm on tv shows i can't play or you know when there's other drummers in the crowd i can't play i'm like well you got to fix that because that's, that's not a healthy state. No, it's not. And ultimately, it's an ego thing, too, right? Like, be, because, I mean, he talks about that in the book, too. But it's like it's tied to the desire to be seen as good or competent. Or maybe it's just a desire for love or something. But ultimately, it's you're afraid of someone else's perception of you. Or you're afraid mm-hmm. you can't rise to the occasion. Like, but I don't know what else it would be. Yeah. Drum clinics are fantastic for that doing drum clinics because it's funny you think you're in a room of brothers yeah you know it's it's a brotherhood right but really Mm -hmm. when you're on stage doing a drum clinic for maybe 75 people or or 50 or 100 people what you see is you see a room full of guys with their arms crossed staring at you oh my god saying impress me yeah a room full of sharks yeah impress me I'm a huge Dennis Chambers fan. Now impress me. And you you have to get over that because you have to say to yourself, I mean, you could be projecting that. They could be there totally digging it. But what you see is you see a room full of that. So then you have to say, okay, turn that off, turn that monologue off in your head and just say, they came here, they want to learn, teach them something, you know, Uh, don't impress them, just teach them something, you know, give them something to go home with so they don't feel like they were, they wasted their hour or you robbed them, you know? Sure. And if you, if you ch- just change that little inner monologue, it fixes everything. But we, but we project these feelings out like they can't, they must not dig it or whatever, you know, you don't know. Well, no. And that's interesting too, because even um, as you're thinking, talking about, you know, like doing TV or whatever, 
Um, you still have the the security blanket, if if you want to call it that, of the drum kit. Like in that, you know, the singer has to actually face the audience, but as a drummer, you get to like you can block them out to some degree. I mean, you can't completely do it, but there is a little bit of like I got this stuff around me. People aren't always looking at me, or they're not supposed to be looking at me, or whatever. Um, but at a clinic where people, it's like a room full of sharks, like you, mm. there, there is no, there's none of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, it doing clinics has really helped me get to the next level as far as, like you said, like I'm really good at being comfortable on stage. I'm really good at being in a band. I'm really mm -hmm. good at doing all these other things because like you said, I'm surrounded by other people. We're making music. We've rehearsed. It sounds great. You know, I'm covered by drums. I can play with my head down. It yeah. doesn't matter. But yeah, when you do something that's a solo thing, now you're the lead singer also, and yep. uh, you're everything. You're the stand-up comedian, and you're alone up there. And so you have to, you know, really reach down deep inside and and, and you know calm yourself and and figure out why you're there and what you have to offer. And uh, I remember once I did a, oh, I think. Oh, it was like the first time I went back to my own alma mater, like my college. They wanted me to come back and do a drum clinic. I've done several since, uh, but the first time I, I went back, I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. I'd love to come back and talk to the students. And and they're like, yeah, last week we had, uh, you know, Dijonette, and next week we have uh, Terry Bozio. So you, it'll be perfect that you're here. I'm like, wow. perfect. It'll be terrible <laughs> for me to be here. <laughs> what? That's like the worst sandwich ever. And, uh, but they're like, no, no, it's going to be great because you don't do what they do. And uh, the kids really want to hear, you know, your point of view too. And what, what, because you went here and then you went out to like, you know, work on professional gigs. They want to hear your side of the story too. So then I took that. Uh, then I started doing clinics like once a year at Musicians Institute in, in Hollywood. And I, same thing. They said the same thing. Like they get all sorts of great drummers to come in. And the guy who books this says, I really, really want you because I want you to be you and t and tell the kids what it is that you do. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's important. And it gave me the confidence to say, I don't have to sound like someone else. I can just sound like me and just bring a good version of me. <laughs> don't bring a crappy version of me, but bring bring the best one I can. And then, you know, that should be good enough. Sure. But that's also the scariest thing as a younger person when you're trying to develop your own style because it's like, you know, and it can be a drag to be like, well, what I got to, you know, there have been so many innovators and so many influential people. And you're like, well, I got to sound like this and this and this and this. And like, no, actually, your job is to not sound like any of them. And and, and there, there also is the thing of like... Um, I read a, a Stuart Co Copeland quote years ago that stuck with me that was like, my style is I learned a bunch of reggae licks, but I learned them wrong. Like, mm -hmm. and that's in, so that's my style. They came out sounding like me because they're incorrect. Um, yeah. But that's or Tony Williams. Uh, another, I love Stuart Copeland and Tony Williams are top five for me. And he, and he, and they, he said, uh, yeah, how did you, how did you develop your unique style? And he's like, I've just been trying to sound like Philly Joe Jones my whole life. And, <laughs> and, but, but it comes out like me. Right. And, uh, and I think that's it. I think your 20s, if you're a drummer out there listening, your 20s is a is a is a decade where you can explore different styles and try to copy other people. There's time for you to do that, to emulate different things. But once you get to your 30s, you have to stop doing that. And you have to really, really start working on your own thing. That doesn't mean you have to give up this and, you know, be so unique that you'll never get a gig or something. I, it just means like the time for cloning other people and copying other people is now over. And now it's really like you have to start figuring out what you do well. You know, what's your best thing? What's your A game? And then to really work on that. You know, I still believe that it's fun to practice everything, you know, be a jack of all trades. But at a certain point, you have to start figuring out what is your thing? What is your feel? What is your touch? What is your drum sound? What is your, your, you know, your best approach to playing beats and music? And then really, really take that from like a B level to an A plus level. I think that's what you have to do in your thirties. And um, yeah, so I think they're both valid. That is fabulous advice though. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's interesting. Um, the in the the Seth Godin book, The Dip, he talks about all of the, and you hear this in different different areas, but like all of the rewards go to like what you want to do is figure out what you can be the best in the world at, and mm-hmm. that's. Um, and the difference between the best and the second best, if you think about, you know, an Olympic race or something is maybe not that much, but the difference in where that will take you is a lot. So, um, that's, it also is like, you strike me as somebody who definitely, and, you know, hearing this background, it makes sense, um, have done that work, you know, um, and, and if I see you put out a video or something, it's like, it's something groovy. It's something, um, and it's it's like I'm always like, man, this guy's just like banging out perfect takes. Um, <laughs> you, but you know what I mean? It's a, it's like kind of deceptive in that way, and you would almost need to be a drummer to understand that, or like you know the like eighth note phrasing and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, it's not. Know, it's, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just say it's not. You're not like you know like like ripping out linear fills or whatever. Yeah, you know what? I do rip out linear fills, but when I'm not recording. Yeah. Because I I am, as much as it seems like I come across as one of those super musical, like uh, less is more, it's about the pocket kind of guys, that is what I do because that's my gig. That's yeah. why people hire me. That's what people like about my drumming. People don't hire me to sound like Tony, you know, uh, Royster Jr. or, you know, Ronald Bruner Jr. or anything like that. Sure. They, I still love that stuff, though. I yeah. love all those guys, and I still shed all that stuff. It's just – I don't think people really want to hear that from me. I think they maybe they want to hear it from a guy who's – that's their thing, you know? Right. Uh, I've learned – actually, it's weird because I don't know it's – it's that chicken and the egg kind of thing. Sometimes I think people – I've worked with a lot of artists – and I think they've almost dictated my style to me more than I did to them. Like the people that hired me for what they like about me have kind of showed me what I do well mm-hmm. because they're like, man, you're really great at this. Can you do this gig for me? Or I love this about you. Can you play on this record? And I'm like, I didn't even know what I was good at or bad at, but right. people have kind of shown lights on what is kind of certain things I do better and what I'm a little weaker at. And that's helped me kind of focus on, what's going to be my a game and what's going to be my, my hobbyist, you know, yeah. on the side. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I didn't, it's not like it was, I would love to be in Meshuggah and in a fusion band and, and in a, and doing live drum and bass. And I'd love to be doing all this stuff. I, I believe me, I practice all that stuff, but the, I don't know if there's enough hours in the day or if, I'll ever get to the level where some of those guys are where they're elite at that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't mean I don't love it. It doesn't mean I don't practice it, but I just don't know if at this point it makes sense for me to try to sound like I can do every single thing as good as everyone else out there, as opposed to just trying to figure out this is kind of what I do the most and what people like. And so I'm going to do this more and, and putting out drum videos is funny because I never used to do that. I, the most I would ever do is put a GoPro camera over one of my shoulders and, 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 you know, record a show. Yeah. That's the most, cause I didn't really think that what I did is very drum video worthy. But then again, talking to enough people, uh, I now have the courage to say, well, this is what I sound like and this is what I get hired for. So some people might want to learn from this. Honestly, that's what makes it so nice to see too, because it is a break from everyone doing the same thing. And mm-hmm. it's like, uh, it also, it's, for me, it, it's refreshing to see. It's like, no, this is this, this is what you should actually tr- be trying to do. Um, just in a sense, if you're a drummer who wants to work, or um, if you want to, you know, think about music in a greater context than just yourself and your own instrument. Um, I think it's really important and I, and I think it's like people kind of rush to, to show off, um, whatever they can do. And because it's like, also it's what people, um, gravitate towards. It's like, it's an easy, it's a way to grab attention. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And, and, and what's, what's interesting to, it's, it's actually very interesting to me because, um, 
you, you see a lot of comments on, on the internet also. I would say that like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are rather kind to me actually. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that write to me on that are just super nice and they always ask great questions. I found that YouTube is probably the meanest out of all the, <laughs> the social media platforms out there. And, and a lot of, people have a lot of crappy things to say to everyone, not just me. Like all of my heroes, I talk to them like due to, uh, you know, the best drummers out there that we can name. And they're like, dude, you never believe what this guy wrote to, on my thing. And I'm like, so you get it too. But I think it's a it's a thing about YouTube. It's a trolling aspect where people just want to throw out their their opinion and make it seem like it's important, and that's fine. But what I find interesting about it is that I get it. I get it. I get that they could be looking at a bunch of different things and they they say, "Who's this guy? This is boring. I could do that." And I'm like, "Maybe you could. Maybe it mm -hmm. is boring. That's not the point. I didn't put this video out." to say that I can do something you can't do or that I'm doing something that no one else can do. I just put it out there because this is music. Yeah. This is drumming. You know, I, yeah. I don't I don't know if everything out there has to be something that no one can do or that's never been done before. I just want to show that this is what drums sound like when you're a professional and you're being hired by pop artists or rock artists to do their gig. This is what it sounds like. Yeah. And uh, but then I see these comments of these young dudes or dudes in basements who are just disgruntled to like, they're like, man, it's not that good. And I'm like, <laughs> it, yeah, it might not be that good, but it is what it is, you know? And, and I hear you because I love drums and yeah. I love technical drums. I love busy drums. I love everything. I love chopsy drums. I love it all, but that's not what I'm trying to show. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, I would do that. I do it every now and then, like every eighth video I put out is some weird linear thing. And then I go back into my world of just putting out pop drums. Yep. But, uh, but uh, you know, that it's funny because they, I just feel like if anyone wanted to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, I can explain to them, but they don't want that. They just want to just have this Meh! kind of uh, like comment. Well, it's, yeah. It's it's a weird power trip kind of thing too, and I know it's funny. I was uh, checking out some earlier, but also it's like, as a musician, you can see that on some level the the person also doesn't get it because I can watch that, but still see and, and like I'm like, man, uh, this I mean I mean you know I don't want to like sound like the the other extreme of the guy, but it's like, um. Like this guy is so focused, the like the groove never wavers for a second. The way that it, like the eighth notes on the hi hat, there's something mm -hmm. like you've got to feel, and and that's a thing that you need to be able to even know to look for that to recognize that you know everything's in its place, everything is super relaxed, everything is where it should be. There's flourishes where they need to be, um, and just the thing about like. <laughs> People who say that, I think, have never screwed up a take in the studio, you know, mm -hmm. um, because if you have uh, and it's, it's like if you've wasted your own money or you've wasted someone else's money and time on you trying to pull off something that you couldn't, mm -hmm. um, then you begin to understand the beauty of simplicity in that situation and also the... Um, the like maybe the fill's not that important because there's an entire song here. Yeah, like again, I am I'm a drummer and a drum lover, mm -hmm. but drummers don't hire me. Right. Drummers don't pay me. You know, the people that hire me are producers, yep. engineers, songwriters, artists, you know. So the way I have learned to play the drums over the past, you know, I don't know, couple decades, the way my playing has changed over time and evolved over time has been through all the suggestions that I've gotten through producers, engineers, artists, and songwriters who are like, you know what I love is I love this. You know what I don't like? I don't like this. And I'm like, note to self. And I collect those notes mm -hmm. of things that they love about drums, things that they don't love about drums. And my style has changed because of that, not because of comments from other drummers about what they want to hear, you know? Yeah. And I, I do I do like the comments because I love drums. And I'm like, sure, get it, you know? But 
my style is different because I listen to producers and engineers who say, you know what I love? Don't do the 16th notes on a hi-hat, do eighth notes. It's gonna leave more room for the song. I'm like, you got it. Mm -hmm. And, or, you know, take out those extra notes from the kick drum. The bass is already doing that. I'm like, you got it. Or, you know, now I need a big Tom fill here, but you know, well, lots of space in it. You know, uh, you got it. And uh, you, everything, they ask me to do things and I have to be able to say, sure, you know, one take, you have it, you know, not, mm -hmm. I don't know. Let me, I got to practice it for a while. Cause that's not what I do. Or, <laughs> right. you know, I, 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 I've developed a style for better or for worse. That is very songwriter, producer, engine, recording engineer friendly. Yeah. And cause those are the people who I want to please first. And I think, I think some drummers get it and some drummers don't get it, you know, and, and I don't mind, I don't mind because I have opinions too. I see drummers where I'm like, mm, I don't get it. And I see other drummers who are like, that dude's the best guy on the planet, you know? <laughs> and I, so I have opinions just like everyone else has opinions, but my, I, I keep them to myself cause I know they're only opinions. Uh -huh. I think some people have to realize that there's a difference between facts and opinions and you can have all the opinions you want, but they're only yours. They're not the truth. They're not the rule and they're not, you know, everyone else doesn't have to agree with you. Um, yeah, that's me. My two well, cents. But no, I've, and especially when you get to something as subjective as music in the first place, like, mm -hmm. but also it it's the thing of, you know, it's all, I mean, whatever. I only clicked on one, but, um, and I don't remember his screen name, so I'm not going to out anybody here, but it's like a dude who doesn't even have a video of himself playing drums so that you can check his claim that he, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, I could do that in my sleep or whatever. Like, okay, man, I would, you know, like, but so obviously it's somebody who feels the need to like, what motivates you to, he's, he's not either. It's like a ghost account. Um, and his drums are on his other channel or else he's like just out. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got something to prove. And so this is how he's getting it out of his system. Now, the only people who write that are people that are, they're not gigging. Yeah. I don't know a single professional drummer who talks that way. No. I don't. I don't. You know, uh, so it's just someone who watches drums. Maybe they're even good. They yeah. could be in their basement freaking burning, but they're not working. No. You know, because, you know, once you, you're you're working all the time, you don't have time to think about that and, and, and try to tear down other people's playing. It doesn't – it goes away. Well, ex right. And also, if you are a type of drummer who it's like your priority is chops and like playing a groove, um, playing a song, or if that's beneath you, like you can't be working. Not very much. Like, I don't know, maybe you're in a prog fusion band. Yeah. You, and that's cool, too. Yeah. Honestly, I do think that if that's like I've said this before at drum clinics, I'm like, you can be a musician's drummer or you can be a drummer's drummer. And I don't put down one or the other, mm -hmm. you know, I think you have, you have like a Jim Keltner on one side yeah. and you have, I don't know, like a Virgil Donati on the other side. And I hold them both up and mm -hmm. I'm like, that's cool, but it's a different path. It's a totally different path. It's the same instrument, but two different approaches, two different paths. Yeah. So you shouldn't try to compare the two. You shouldn't say, Virgil Donati, Donati is so much better than Jim Keltner or Jim Keltner is so much better than Virgil Donati. They're just two different ways of looking at the same contraption called the drum set. You know, yeah. it's your two different applications. So I don't think if you're down one, like whatever Avenue, a Mike Mangini Avenue or something, great. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, study that, make a prog band, do that. That's cool. If you're into like super crusty J bell rose kind of drumming, then that's cool. Go down that route, but don't, you don't have to just like, uh, you know, insult the other side because that's not what you're into. You know, they're just, they're too, they're so different. I don't know why you would try to even compare them. Um, the ego needs an enemy. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's always us against them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And seriously, it always comes down to that. I, I, I read a study not too long ago that said like they put like these second graders in a classroom together 
that were all friends, you know, whatever, 22nd graders. And one day without telling them why they made half of them wear red t-shirts, half of them wear blue t-shirts. And they said, and without saying anything, okay, kids, here's your uniforms. By the end of the day, they had already divided and they all were already battling over everything. You know, red team is better than blue team. You suck. Blue team's better than they can't. They couldn't help it because it's in our human nature, Mm -hmm. like to divide and be tribal, you know, to like us versus them. We do it with sports. We do it with countries. We do it with states within our country. We do it with regions of our city, like the east side versus the west side of your city. You do it with everything. And it's a strange human um, uh, instinct, I guess. It is. Yeah, I know. It's funny. Like I grew up in, um, so I'm from Prince Edward Island, Canada, and I grew up in the country and the, the kind of factions between the, the small towns of, you know, like these guys don't like these guys. And I kind of grew up in between the two high schools. So the people in Summerside, which was the city, which is like, it is technically a city, but um, mm-hmm. not really. And then the people who went to the other high school, they didn't like each other, but because of where I lived, I associated with both and I didn't really. And when I played hockey, I played uh, again because of where I lived on the French team, which was a, a third enemy. Um, so, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. it was really weird because I would, you know, go to school and all of these guys would be like talking smack about these guys over here that when I worked my part time job, they were my friends and then they hated the guys that I went and they would, you know, go into town on the weekends and get in fights and whatever. Um, so dumb, but it also is like, it reminded me of, and and I mean, this is dark, but I went to Scotland a few years ago and it was really, um, it really struck me. Uh, we went to, um, Aelin Don and Castle, which on the, on the recommendation of my optometrist, um, which is where Highlander was filmed. Apparently I haven't seen any of the movies, but Mm. it is a, uh, really well-preserved castle near the Isle of Skye. And... Um, you read the history of the place and it's like this clan lived here for, you know, 1300 to 1340. And then in 1340, this other clan came in and killed them all. And then they lived here and then they lived here for 60 years. And then somebody else came in and killed them all. And they lived here and they're always like battling over this place. And they've got the turrets. And I mean, you know, I've seen castles in movies and whatever toys growing up, but I hadn't seen one in person. But, yeah, and then and then the great unifier would be that sci-fi plot where an alien ship comes to destroy the Earth, and we all have to be friends and fight <laughs> the aliens. So we need a common enemy for us to get along, and it's true. Yep. We would figure it out if these aliens came over to take over Earth. Then we'd have a common enemy outside our our own planetary system or whatever. But until then, we're still gonna war within we, amongst each other. It's really bizarre. Hmm. Very strange. Um, all right, sir. Uh, if you'll indulge me, you are you are someone who's very serious about the drums, I gather. So let's take it back to the beginning. How did you start playing? Oh, I thought we were never going to talk about drums. That's great. <laughs> books, books and psychology. How did I start drums? Let me think. I know this answer. Let me just think back. I was. I grew up in this suburban town in New Jersey, uh, not too far from New York City. I did like a whole bunch of activities, you know, as far as like playing baseball and skateboarding. And I also played instruments in the school orchestra. So Mm -hmm. I played trumpet and things like that. I took piano lessons. uh, And somewhere along the way, I I noticed a drum set in the band room. And I'm like, I want to learn how to do that too. So I'd watch MTV, I'd memorize a few grooves and I'd go practice during my lunch period. And that was around eighth grade. Yeah. Uh, so I was maybe 13 at the time and I'd learned how to go boof, bah, boof, boof, bah. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. So I, I said, I, I don't want to play trumpet and piano anymore. This is what I want to do. And they're like, well, no, you're a trumpet player. So I had to wait until I went to high school. And that was when I was 14, I switched schools. Cause yeah, I went from like middle school to high school. And there I walked into the band room on day one and said, Hey, I'm a drummer. I want to sign up for, ba- for band. So then I switched cold turkey at that point and i played drums all through high school like marching band jazz band orchestra timpani cymbals triangle everything and um yeah and then when i was 18 i had a ch- i had the 
you know, I was going to go to college somewhere and study mm-hmm. something. And I was looking at different colleges and different majors. And I imagined myself struggling to find a place to practice while I was studying engineering or something at some college. And I confessed to my mother that I really, really can't stop thinking about the drums. And I think that's all I want to do. And I said, could I go to a music conservatory instead? And they had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, Like, they're not in that field. So I said, I'll find some places, I'll audition. And if I get in, can I go? And my parents agreed to let me go for a year. And I went to the University of Miami and it went really well. I got a bunch of scholarships. And so they said, okay, you can study this for several years. And then I got out and, uh, you know, it's been a slow process ever since. That's, that's the, that's the short story. Anything right. you want me to elaborate on, I will. Um, it's, it's a lot to unpack. Um, uh, a, que- a, a couple of questions that pop out. Uh, one is that your high school did in fact have a marching band. Oh yeah. H- That's how big? big in the U S yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've, I've seen it. Um, but, um, how, how big would your school have been? My school had, uh, a, a class, uh, body of about 2000 kids. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, so there was a football team. And if there's a football team, there's going to be a marching band. Yeah. And fortunately, a lot of I mean, a lot of marching bands are junk. Uh, but the <laughs> one I was in, uh, fortunately, because of the instructors, they were all super strict and into it. So it was like uh, rudimentary drumming, like really, really intense. I was not prepared for that. I had to practice like crazy just to keep up. And it was good for my chops. So, you know, I felt like I was a late starter. So it was really good for me. Yeah, absolutely. Were you doing like drum line stuff? Like, yeah, the, yeah. the actual, the drum line teacher was this drummer, Tommy Igo. Uh, you probably heard of him, right? Yes. So he was the teacher of my drum line when I joined. Wild. Did he yeah. teach at the school or was he like working with that group? He was good friends with my like orchestra director. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he hired him to like just run the the drum marching line, mm-hmm. and uh, how actually I approached him first just to take drum lessons. I said, "Could I take lessons with you?" He goes, eh, "If you want to take lessons with me, you have to do my whole program." I'm like, "What's the whole program mean?" He goes, "You have to do my marching band. You have to take private lessons with me. You have to be in the jazz bands." And I'm like, "All right, I'll do it." So I did you all, did all of, of it. it. It was like a like um you know whole like immersion course of drumming. That is so intense. And you were what, like 15? I was 15 at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and did you just like kind of no looking back, just dove into it? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved it. Um, all my other activities started to, uh, you know, fall away as I mm-hmm. got more and more into the drums. And yeah, when I was 18, I was like, I, I don't know. I kind of want to keep on doing this. I don't even know if I'm worthy or good enough to do this, but I want to give it a shot, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so why the University of Miami? Uh, I, I looked at a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the, a couple of things that I liked about that one was it was a small uh, class of uh, drummers as far as I think there were 50 drummers there. Mm-hmm. You go to any other place like a Berkeley or a, a U- North Texas or any of these other schools which have good drum departments, it's over 200 kids. So I thought that was good. It was in a big city which mm-hmm. meant that I can go see music or go out and possibly gig. If yeah. uh, That was important for me was not to just go out in the middle of nowhere and just practice in a carpeted room, but to actually go out and make music with people. Um, yeah, I had a couple people that had gone there that, that gave me like a thumbs up, and I knew a couple of the professors that were teaching there. Um, so that was it. I mean... I really, really wanted to stay in the New York City area. I really did. But something, for whatever reason, I chose Miami. And it was, it was really, I look back, it was a fantastic choice. You know, you know, you can't really like make left and right turns and and really say, what if, what if this happened? What if that happened? But so many things happened out of, out of me going there that was positive. So I really like it. Yeah, cool. Uh, what is the program like there? Is there like a, a specific musical direction that it's focused in? Mm, it tries to stay part mostly like there are a lot of schools that are very traditional. Either their mm-hmm. classical departments are kind of the thing 
or or the bebop old school jazz is their thing like max roach vibe or their big band jazz is their thing i think university of miami they try to have like one foot always in the modern world like it's okay if you just want to be like a, a rock drummer that's mm -hmm. cool too you know take take the jazz class but it's okay if you have a d minus we're not going to kick you out as long <laughs> as you as long as you do well at some type of drumming and i think right. they make you they make you do marimba and timpani and and everything and, and play congas they make you do everything but i think they're kind of welcoming to the idea that you might not be into bebop uh, you might be into jeff Picaro, and that's not bad yeah so i think they they allow different people and a lot of great drummers went there even when i was there like i remember there's a drummer named ed toth who's mm -hmm. the drummer for the doobie brothers i remember he he was a couple years ahead of me but i remember he used to always talk about just man all i want to do is play two and four and I'm like, oh, all I want to do is all I want to do is do drum solos. And he's yeah, like, no, all man, I want to do is everything. <laughs> and he just and he was like, he would just practice his pocket. And this is in school. And this guy was in a practice room just going. Doot, ish, doot, ish, doot, ish. And sure enough, he had a killer pocket and he got a ton of pop gigs when he got out of school, you know. And uh, there's a lot of um, other drummers that went there when I was there. A guy named Jason Sutter was there with me. Um, a couple other guys. But um yeah, and everyone sounded different, and everyone mm -hmm. played different and had different talents, and I guess that's what that's what they they pushed. It was small enough where they could watch over you and kind of guide you, even if you were doing your own thing. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's a beautiful thing about it too, is that and that you can put a bunch of people in the different in the same environment, and they'll all come out different. Mm -hmm. it, uh, if they're allowed to it's funny thinking you know and i'm trying not to um this been doing this has actually been good drum therapy for me but you're listing off your reasons and like i went to a jazz school in the middle of the woods um <laughs> where like i and didn't put a lot of thought into it really it was you know like regionally nearby and similar kind of thing like all my friends were I, you know i was going to go somewhere um, and it was really for me, the difference between like, um, drum set and classical, um, in the audition was a breeze. Um, but the, um, it was like jazz or nothing, mm -hmm. um, which was just, it was just a bummer because, you know, you also are confronted even while you're there. It's like, well, I'm, my friends in the music department are into this music. No one else that I know is into it. You know what I mean? I'm like not yeah. knocking it, but to kind of to hold it up as like the only legitimate path is um, it, was, it was certainly difficult for me to kind of um, wrap my head around. But also it's like, <laughs> I mean, whatever, people can do what they want with their lives, but it kind of feels irresponsible in a way of like, that is a tough road and you have got to be dedicated if you're good. And I mean, they did instill that certainly. You know what? This is a topic that has come up m m a lot of times with my friends is what is the proper way to structure a college curriculum? And it should be, sh should it be to teach everyone the history of drumming or should it be to prepare them for what drumming is like right now? You know, and they're two different roads. Yeah. You know, and or can you do a little bit of both? Can you do two years of the history of drumming? And can you do two years of really getting their chops together to come out ready to work? You mm -hmm. know, and there is no real right answer. I don't think any school has it down perfect. But I think University of Miami tried to have that in consideration. All the teachers were very progressive. And thinking back now, I, I'm just thinking that. They had things like you could pick the drummer that you wanted to study. Neat. Like it's not like like we didn't just study Elvin Jones for yeah. two years. Like they would, you know, if a kid came in and said, you know who I'm into? Manu Kache. And he's like, OK, well, you can work on Manu Kache this semester. Cool. And you but but like but you got to work on it. But you got to like work. You actually have to you got to transcribe his stuff. And at the end of the semester, you have to play a bunch of Peter Gabriel songs in front of the in the front of the school. And I want to hear, you know, you have that thing together. So you could pick That's a drummer, amazing. but you had to make that like your your thing. And you could also pick a style of music. 
Like I remember one one year, uh, a bunch of us got together and said, we want to study the music of Stevie Wonder. And like, and the teacher said, go ahead. For the next three months, you know, you guys put a band together of students and go through his catalog and then put on a concert, you know, at the end of the semester. And that'll be your little group. You don't have to only play, you know, whatever, like Miles Davis. You know, they, yeah. they would allow you to do things if you had an interest, but you had to really study it and show that you're getting into it. And I think that was cool. There was like, you know, you could do Frank Zappa, you can do Steely Dan. They mm -hmm. had things that you can do that were musical, but not bebop or not big band. And I think that was really smart of them to, to have that. They had a studio on campus so you can practice recording also. They had like, and you, you can do sessions with the other guys there. And yeah, it was, a, it was a great training ground. Yeah. Super cool. Well, also, I mean, I, I think, um, whatever uh, like my opinion ultimately doesn't matter on this but um to to put somebody in that situation of like sure this is your interest but you need to be serious about it um mm -hmm. it's not just a way of like rejecting whatever it is we do here um you actually you got to because it does prepare prepare you to actually work because you get out mm -hmm. there and people aren't like looking to wait for you to figure it out um the only other thing that I know about the University of Miami, um, there's a guy, a, a drum teacher up in Halifax who had gone there and he said um, uh, that Andrew Cyril had taught there. Was he there when you were there? He played with Cecil Taylor. That's what I know him as. I know the name. I yeah. don't rem He wasn't there with me. So Okay. Mm-hmm. It would have been earlier. I just thought that was interesting. I'm like curious what that guy's. Well, they have a, they have a legacy of different eras, like the '80s. I didn't go there in the '80s, but the '80s had like Jocko, Pat Metheny, uh, a guy named Steve Morse, um, like the whole Pat Metheny group with Danny Gottlieb. That that they they all went to school there. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, they have a a long list of al alumni that are you know pretty famous. Um, yeah, Bruce Hornsby went there. <laughs> really? Ben, Fold, ben Folds went there. I thought that Hornsby was a Berkeley guy. Uh, well, he might have gone there too, but he was definitely a Miami guy because he would come back and do seminars, songwriting Wild. seminars. Wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben Folds. That's interesting. Okay, so and while you're going to school, were you, you were you gigging? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, almost immediately because it was, you know, there were it. The city was big enough, and there were enough restaurants and hotels that that needed music. So. When I was a freshman, we put a, put together a little quintet and we would play either a, a cover band or a jazz band or something. And it was, yeah, I mean, I remember my first semester, I already had a steady gig at some bar down the street. And I'm like, this is great. And uh, and this is what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and it got to the point where, you know, you go to school from like maybe eight to five p.m. And then you practice, you would eat dinner and then practice from, you know, whatever. 7 to 9 p.m. and then you'd go do a gig at night and Miami's yeah. a late city so you work from like 10 to 2 in the morning and then you do it over again and you'd be shattered but it was great you're like yeah living the dream sure I mean and and there's the sleep thing and I mean I think too at that age ultimately it's like if you have an opportunity to be out and playing like that's what you're going to do yeah absolutely absolutely I was you know totally happy to be like running around and like a chicken with his head cut off. I love yeah. it. Um, and what is the music scene there like? I mean, obviously in a big city you get everything, but I mean, I would tend to think of like Pitbull or, you know, club That's music. That's probably the, what the music scene is right now. I haven't lived there in so long. Yeah. Uh, but when I was going there, it had a really cool rock scene. It had a really great jazz scene. Uh, I mean, burning jazz musicians, fantastic rock bands. Um, it had like your like just plethora of cover bands and salsa bands and things like that. There's a huge Latin scene there and um, a lot of recording studios at the time. And I mean, Gloria Stefan was huge at, the, at that mm -hmm. point. Um, yeah. And, um, and then I moved, I, I mean, I moved in uh, 2004, so it's been quite a while. I can't tell you what the scene is like now. Sure. But it was great. When I was there, it was just super eclectic and a great training ground. I, I, I did a lot of fun gigs with rock bands and super, 
you know, pop click kind of artists. And yeah, it was cool. Cool. I think it's more like dance, dance club or oriented now. I think a lot of that has taken over. Yeah, that's the the impression that I get. But I mean, you know, as somebody who hasn't really uh, investigated too deeply. Um, so did you go from Miami straight to L.A.? Yeah. 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 I moved to L.A. in 2004. And I, if I remember correctly, it was like on my 30th birthday, I think. Mm hmm. I think they remember I was talking earlier about, you know, your 20s are for one thing, your 30s are for another thing. I said, I have to, you know, do something different. And right. Sure. But that's so um, that. So did you stick around L.A. and and gig for a while then after or sorry, around Miami and gig for a while after school? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I did not plan on it. Like I said, I was fascinated with New York City. That was like my dream was to move back to the Northeast because I'm from Jersey. So I'm like, that's it. I want to go to school here and then I want to go. Uh, you know, Bill Stewart at the time was my favorite drummer on the planet. So I'm like, I just want to do every gig he can't get, you know, <laughs> every gig, I mean, every gig, every gig he turns down, that's what I want. But then, uh, you know, obviously I was nowhere near as good as he was, but, um, and, but then in Miami, I was just working with so many artists by the time I was like 21 that I kept on thinking, I'm just going to stay one more year and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say one more year. I was playing in bands that were signed to different labels. I was going on tour with, you know, big Latin artists. And I'm like, I'm just going to wait for my lease to be up and then I'm going to move. And I'm going to wait one more year. And that kept on going till at one point I, I gave myself like a, a cutoff. I said, I don't care how good I'm doing. I'm moving <laughs> at the end of this year. And so, yeah, I stayed for uh, a number of years and then just cut it off. Funny. And when you said that I'm moving, was it specifically to L.A. or just somewhere else? Well, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who is now my wife. But at the time, I kind of let her decide, believe mm -hmm. it or not. I said, I'll give you a list of like maybe six or eight cities that have music scenes and you can pick. And we went and we visited a bunch. We went to New York, of course, London, uh, San Francisco. Um, I don't know, uh, several other ones. And um uh, and she loved L.A. and I love L.A. So I'm like, yeah, L.A. is fantastic. Let's do it. So because I at the time I thought. You know, if she's not happy, I'm going to be miserable. So she has to I have to find a place that she's going to be happy, too. You know, yeah. So we, we moved together. Uh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, you got to live there ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. And L.A. is. Super nice. It's super nice. Have you been? Yes. Yeah, it's super nice. It's like it's like almost suspiciously nice where you're yeah. like what like what's wrong with this place why is everyone so friendly and why is the food so good and why is it always sunny like what's gonna happen is there just like a meteor floating above us just ready to drop like what's wrong with that's what I, I was surprised by um and i was kind of i was a little bit like maybe on guard for um, you know, going, getting ready to be like, you know, thinking like, oh, people in LA, because you hear like, everybody's so hip, everybody's so fake. Um, and like, here I am like a rube from Atlanta, Canada, like, you know, who is going, I'm just expecting people to be, I, I don't know, to be dismissed everywhere I went or whatever. People, it's, people it's, were friendly. It's like, it's like we were talking about with tribalism before. I mean, I grew up on the East coast of the U S yeah, the East, um, you know, New York, Miami, you're not supposed to like people from the West coast. No, they're like, the, they're like the anti you. So I come, I came out with the same suspicions, but I just, it's just that whole thing about fake or there's too much traffic. It's just not real. It's not <laughs> real. There is that element, but that is only like deep Hollywood. Like if you're, if you're really like hustling to be some kind of actor or something, yeah. you might get that. But in the music world, the musicians in LA, I have to say, you know, 99.9% .9 of them are just the nicest, like most generous people. And it's crazy. Like, I don't know where, that stereotype came from but it is i mean i'm i'm blown away by how nice people are here i yeah i was too i was really surprised and uh i mean i do think like you know sunshine certainly has an effect on my mood like i'm just happier mm -hmm. and um it would tend to be nicer but yeah i found more of that attitude in boston uh, versus mm -hmm. la where especially as like, you tell people you're from canada and um you know, they sort of like I've gotten, you know, you're not from Quebec, are you? And I've also <laughs> gotten 
I had the, the guy at Starbucks like smirked at me when I said I was like driving back to Canada that day. Oh boy. Yeah, it's just it's you funny. Know like, so I, I, um, you, you probably know this because when we reached out, we were talking a little bit about backstory, but I did a tour with Tegan and Sarah. Yes. And, um, I, I had worked with Canadians before I had been to Canada before, but that was my real, like my Canadian gig because we went to a lot of cities. I got all this funny backstory about Canadian, this Canadian, that the history of this, what's a, what's what I should look out for in this city, what these people are like, you know, it was great. Um, we went to like prior to playing with them, I had only been to Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. Mm -hmm. I would just do, that's where Americans go to play gigs. If they don't know anyone Canadian, they just go Absolutely. to those three cities, right? I, I mean, I went to New York. I said I was Canadian and they asked me if I was from one of those three cities. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. then I, then when I started touring with, uh, Tegan and Sarah, we went to all these other cities. They were all fantastic. Everyone was great. And I loved it. And uh, I found amazing coffee in every one of those cities somehow. And, um, yeah, but but it, it's it was great. It was great to go to all these places I never got to go to before. And every time they would tell me like, you know, what's cool about this city or or what what the people are like in this city, and you know, this is more of a working class town, or this is more of like a you know a kind of a upper class town, or this is you know, it was so cool. That was a great tour. That's interesting. That's so sweet because they would have come up doing it too. Like they would have they'd be playing bigger venues now. Um, I, like I know you would have uh, you played in Halifax with them, and um, I don't know if you'd remember that show. And what like what would the venues have been like on that tour? We did mostly theaters on that tour, yeah. rock clubs and theaters. Right. So um, Rebecca Cohen Auditorium probably in Halifax. Maybe, maybe I don't remember the. I remember we definitely did Edmonton, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, um, uh, Calgary. Um, I, you name it. We did all all, yeah. all the ones that I always wanted to go visit. We did them. Long drives out there. Yeah, yeah. There were some long bus drives. Yeah, yeah. like like a like day and a half or two days sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. But they would have like they would be uh, a group that came up too doing like I'm sure like campus bars and those those sorts of things. Yeah. And they had tons yeah. of funny stories about that. Just being an acoustic folk lesbian duo like yeah. playing bars yeah and 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 how they said that that's how they learn their stage banter because they're very funny live and they said they had to learn that as like a mechanism to to take to take over the the stage from people just you know heckling them all the time i bet that is so funny so um <clears throat> I, I skipped over a question I was, I was interested in, but um, speaking of Canada, so I'm in New Brunswick right now. I am two hours south of the Sabian factory. Have mm -hmm. you been? Is that Metuchen or what's it called? Uh, Meductic. Meductic, that's it. Metuchen's yeah. a city in, in, in New Jersey. I get it mixed up. I have not been. I have not been. I was someplace very close to there once. I don't know what's close to there, but because Sabian, I was at a gig with Tegan and Sarah and they, and Sabin had a booth at the gig and they were doing like a symbol hammering thing. And I'm mm -hmm. like, Hey guys, I'm a Sabian dude. Can I, can I check this out? Like, Oh my God. Great. But no. And they of course they, they invited me to the factory. I've been invited many times, but I've never been, I've been to the office. There's an office in Burbank, mm -hmm. California, which is why I never go anywhere else. I just go to that one. I haven't, they used to have a place in Boston. I didn't even go there. You know, I've only been to the one in in L.A. Right. Well, me, OK, have you been. Uh, no, I haven't. And I, I live nearby. I mean, I didn't always live here, but um, no, it's on my list. I'm, right now is a weird time to go visit anywhere. But um, I'm curious. Apparently it's, it's worth doing. But I do also know that people drop in who like wouldn't otherwise be in rural New Brunswick. So I'm always curious who is the the. There's, I've been with Saban forever, and the invitation has always been out there. And they've always thrown around, thrown around the idea of like, just come up, uh, and and we'll make you some symbols, you know, whatever you want. We'll make them from scratch. And I think that actually intimidates me because <laughs> I don't want I don't want to have the uh, responsibility of designing a ride symbol. I'm sure, like, yeah, I, you I just, just I just want to pick one that sounds good. I don't want to be in there making it with you. Yeah, you know you want you don't want the like the Dijonet series or the the Omnis or whatever. 
I don't want. Um, I don't want the responsibility. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't if either. If you're in any, if you're in any drum store and you hit enough cymbals, they all start to sound the same. Sure. After about the hundredth cymbal, you're like, your ears are ringing. You're like, I don't know. They're all good, I guess. So I imagine if I go to a Sabian factory, you're like, spend a day here, test everything, we'll hammer anything. I bet about an hour in, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's the funny thing too of the like you know the the real trashy rides or whatever, um, which it, it's kind of like I don't know maybe whiskeys or cheeses or something where it's like you know it, it, you think that it stinks at first, but then mm -hmm. you realize that no that that's actually a quality and this is actually really good. Um, mm -hmm. But it is funny in the, in that sense. Like I do find it with, especially with jazz rides, where the the line between it's like it takes an educated ear to even know that like this actually this like no, it doesn't sound like garbage. It sounds like like if you if you know how to play it, it sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. But it it is funny where that you go like you know in the grades of symbols from like clang to sort of you got like shimmer and and some darkness and. Uh, expressiveness and then you've got like the really like um ton of character but i i think particularly in that world you know when you, when you say that that's just i i suppose where my mind goes um but like just looking at a wall of like really kind of like beat up looking kind of uh trashy jazz rides that i mean you play five of them can you tell the difference um, yeah, what's good about the office in Burbank is uh, the guy there is Chris Stanky, and he's he's been there for a while. He's great at picking symbols, and he kind of knows people's personalities too. So you can walk in, and he'll say, "Hey, I want to I want to show you some things," and he'll just it's almost like a blind test. He'll just put up some symbols for you. Say, "What do you think of these?" And you're like, "That's pretty cool. Ooh, I really like this one. This would be cool if it were 19 inches, not 17. You know, whatever." Mm -hmm. And he keeps on putting up different symbols that he thinks you might like. And what's cool is you can take them home. You can go play a gig with them and bring them back next week. He's cool with that. So it's really hard to be in a drum room of a guitar center and see if you actually want to use these cymbals on a gig. But if you actually play them and then take them home and put them in the studio, A, B them with some of your other cymbals that you mm -hmm. love, uh, say, oh, this one isn't as good as my other hi-hats, or this one is blowing away my other hi-hats. Oh, my God. And you can really, you know, try them. You can bring them to a gig and say, I thought they were good, but they're really way too dark. I didn't yeah. think they were going to whatever. And then you can bring them back and say, hey, thank you. I kept the splash symbol and you can have everything else, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, he, and, he's, and he's totally cool with that. And that's that's why I guess I haven't been to any of the other Sabian places because I have that resource. And it's been I mean, since I moved here, it's been so helpful. Yeah. And any tour I have coming up, I go there and I tell him what the style of music is. He's like, oh, cool. So how about we go for this, this, and this, this hi-hat, this crash, this ride. And you, you test it out during the rehearsals and you tell me what you think. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to have that resource, you know? Yeah. How did you, um, how did you become a Sabian artist? How did you connect with them? Hmm. I was going to music school and college and one of the, instructors there the classical instructors his name is keith aleo and now he has since become uh, one of the orchestral percussion educators at zildjian i believe mm -hmm. but back at the back in the day he was a like he played in an orchestra and he was my classical teacher and he raved about um the sabian viennese uh crash cymbals and then um but in college i didn't have an endorsement i just played the zildjians that i had in high school yeah. And then one of my friends named Jason Sutter, he graduated and got a gig with um, a rock band, a girl named Juliana Hatfield. Mm -hmm. And he got an he got an, an endorsement with Sabian. And so between my friend Jason and my classical percussion teacher, Keith, uh, they both said, dude, Sabian is just like Zildjian but they'll return your phone calls. That's what he, that's what he told me. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, that sounds great. Well, because so it's wrote, the family recipe, right? It's family recipe. And, uh, you know, uh, he said they're, they're really great with their artists. Write them a letter. So I wrote them a letter. This is old school. I wrote them a handwritten letter. And the guys wrote me back saying, hey, thanks for reaching out. We'd love to follow your career. Just if you get any of these things, and they listed like five things, if you get into a band that gets signed to a record label, if you go on a tour with any pop artist, if you 
uh, plan a TV show or if you get a gig as an instructor at some college or what I, I forgot what it was something like mm -hmm. that. They gave me a list. Of, if you get any of these, let us know and then we can go ahead with an endorsement for you. And like a day later, I got I got some tour and I wrote them back saying, hey, good news. I got a tour They're like, cool. Let's 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 pick out a set of symbols for you. And they sent me some. I was still living in Miami at the time. Uh, and so they mailed them to you. They mailed them to me in a box. And that was 19. I think it was 1997. Mm -hmm. So I've been with them, I think, since then. Wow. Yeah. And what's funny is there are so many great symbol companies out there. And all of my friends play Zilligens, Pisces, Istanbul. They're all great. Yeah. And uh, but I feel like I have like this almost like a familial thing with Sabian at this point. You know, that um, uh, it's, I mean, all these symbols in my studio behind me, they're all Sabians, you know? And, yeah. You know, I just, and I'm not doing this, you know, for endorsement reasons. It's just, they all sound great, you know? Yeah, they they do have some great ones. It's funny, um, I was talking to somebody about this recently, um, how especially here, um, a lot of the symbols that you tend to see um, growing up, I mean, it would be similar to like, uh, PV amps in a way uh, mm -hmm. where you tend to see a lot of the the budget models, but and you don't realize kind of th the extent of what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I and I and I understand that they're uh, they're also quite artist friendly. Um, yeah, Dave Elich is also a Sabian guy. He is. He is. Yeah, and Dave's a good friend of mine. Have you spoken with him? I oh, you did a lesson with him. You said. I did do a lesson with yeah. him. Yeah, when I went to LA. Um, yeah, it was quite an experience, man. Um, I had never been before, um, just to LA in general, and I did uh, yeah. did a bunch of stuff. No, I really, I really love Dave, and uh, I met him at a Vic Firth dinner party one night, and we sat next to each other, and we were talking about you know speed metal drumming or something, and uh, and and uh, and I'm thinking, I find I find this guy very interesting. Uh, and I wonder if he thinks, I wonder if he, I would guess I was insecure. I'm like, I wonder if he thinks I'm like a drummer who can't play at all. <laughs> or, Does he like me? Uh, or if he's, you know, if we're friends, I can't tell if we're friends or not. And then, but we, and then I think we, we grabbed the taco. We talked about like, um, you know, documentaries and books and everything. And then I realized, oh, we connect in so many different levels. I think he's a fantastic human being. Uh, and very smart, uh, uh, yeah. very uh, very uh, dedicated to his uh, approach to drumming, which I think is great. And uh, and also he's really kind of uh, helped me get out of a few ruts, you know, drumming wise even because you know I'm I love to practice, I love to self analyze and tear my own technique apart and put it back together again. But s sometimes even I need to ask someone like, hey man, what do you do with your left foot on this or you know, what's going on with, with this or, you know, what about this fill? Is this a stupid fill or is this a cool fill? And he's, he's one of those guys who has like black and white opinions about a lot of things. So yes. it's very good. You yep. know, it's not wishy-washy. He'll tell you, this is cool. That's lame. And I'm like, cool. Good to know. <laughs> well, that's what I found. And it was like, you know, I was I'm intimidated to begin with walking in there, but also, yeah, he doesn't pull punches. Like he will, and he, but he will be kind about it in the sense like he, he was nice to me for sure. But it's like, if something you're doing sucks, like he's, he's going to let you know. Um, I know it was, it was certainly nice for me as somebody like I specifically was looking for help with, um, like I had, you know, knee problems and wrist problems and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know I, I have not um, kept on top of it as much as I could have, but um, pretty eye-opening. But also just to, to hear him talk about because I asked him kind of how he developed his approach, and he's like, you know, well, I would take lessons from this guy, and um, I yeah, he would show me some stuff, and I'd be like, no, that like <laughs> like that's bullshit, but th this is cool. And it's like... For some, I I am not analytically minded in that way, um, so I tend to just take all of those things at face value. I just found it so like it was like that was a light bulb in itself um, that somebody could look at you know somebody's technical approach and say like you know I agree with this part of it, but but not that part of it. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm someone who's always looking or was uh, always looking for somebody to. Um, 
show you the right way to do it or accept whatever you're shown as like, this is the correct way to do it. Whatever you think is wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, I am one of those people who is a bit skeptical mm -hmm. when it comes to anyone claiming that they have the answer, mm -hmm. you know, I have the answer to this because I believe that there's just, the world has shown that there's just too many ways to do something mm -hmm. and a lot of them work. You know, if there was only one way to swing a bat, everyone would do it that way. But then you right. get up, you watch a baseball game and everyone's swinging the bat slightly differently. You're like, have, baseball has been around for so long now. Haven't they figured out what the perfect swing is? But yeah. then another guy does another way. Another guy does it another way. It's like, it's so odd to me, you know, that they're still trying to, you know, they're still, um, divisiveness in the in the mechanics of this and mm -hmm. i feel like drums forget about it you, you could talk to like a hundred quote unquote uh esteemed drum educators and they'll all play differently and they'll yeah. hold the sticks differently hit differently phrase differently and uh i think it's cool that they do i only think it's weird when they say that my way is the only way and those ways are not the way because um yeah, I, I don't know if that's the truth because you'll see exceptions to the to that point all the time. You'll see someone uh, who has the most flowing, loose technique. You're like, oh, that's the way you want to play. And then you uh -huh. see some guy just squeezing the life out of <laughs> drumsticks and sounding amazing, sounding amazing. And you're like, well, he's got he's onto something too. You know, it's just I I mean when when it comes to technique, I draw the line at things like pain. Mm -hmm pain injury and whatever is holding you back from expressing yourself if mm -hmm. you're experiencing pain injury or you cannot express yourself because of your technique then you need to change things but if you have some weird way of doing something that it's still working for you i think that's fantastic it's and and what's fine. great about dave is dave is really black and white yeah but he also understands that element because, uh, you know, he'll, I'll ask him this, 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 and, and then I, and he'll say, well, how, I feel this, this, this way. I'm like, well, what about Steve Jordan? How come he does that? He goes, well, Steve's amazing, and that's awesome. And he's, like, <laughs> you know, he's Steve Jordan, and, you're, and he's allowed to do that. And, I'm, that, and I, I'm like, exactly. If you are reached a certain level doing something a certain way, you, that guy doesn't have to relearn how to play the bass drum or relearn how to play a rim shot. You know, no, he's, he's fine. cool. Yeah. He's fine. He's doing fine, you know. But it's the people that are experiencing pain or discomfort or they're struggling where, you know, someone like Dave can come in and really say, I, I've got a lot of research and a lot of years that's going to help you, you know, with your problems. And I think that's cool. And I also one of the things I like about him is that he's totally I don't want to say irreverent, but I will because he'll probably use that word is like to 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 the past. He yes. doesn't care what he doesn't care what people did in 1940 because he understands that it's a different ball game now that drums are tuned differently. They're not tight and bouncy anymore. They're thuddy, yep. you know, and they're bigger. And he understands that people hit harder than they used to. It's and, so and much louder. Music, yeah. And music has changed. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you see, if you see some old video of Papa Joe Jones playing, it's amazing. He looks incredible. His technique's incredible. But you're also like, that's an entirely different style of music and different setup and different everything. Nobody plays that way anymore. You no. can't say, I want that technique because that technique doesn't exist now. You know? It's, well, it's, yeah, or it's not going to be usable in any gig that you are going to get. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's, you, you know, it's, so I think uh, you have to realize that you might want to go study what the stroke that someone used in 1908. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, but I'm not sure if that's going to work now. It's like that's what we were saying before with curriculum of, of music conservatories. Are we studying the history, the classical history of, of your instrument, or are we studying what it takes to work today? Yeah. And they're two different things. And if you could do both, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But if you have a limited amount of time and resources, it might behoove you to focus more on what is a working drummer using today, you know? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting. I, I found him, uh, I found that, uh, surprised me too when I went to see him, um, that irreverence. Um, 
All right. I feel like you just gave me a perfect ending, and I uh, talked over it. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I, you don't have to cut off for me at any point, but if you're done, if you're done yapping, we, we can stop. But, you know. No, I'm I not. Just, I, I, was just... Take, I was just taking a sip of tea. But <laughs> Okay. No, no, I, 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 um, I'm just conscious. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, um, but... Um, as you're talking, I was thinking also circ- circling back to earlier, you talk about different players have different technique. It also is a situation where, um, you know, as you were saying, the, um, you know, every service is different. The angles are different. The positioning is different. Every drum kit is slightly different. The sizes are different. The tuning are different. The temperature is going to affect it. The weather is going to affect it. Also, all of us are different heights. Our limbs are different lengths. You know, joints are maybe in different places. Um, so all of it's got to come into consideration. I know it. I I went to see. Um, I've only been to the Village Vanguard once, but I saw the Heath brothers there, and I mean that was like a really great thing to see too. Because like here is this guy who sounds great, and he's sticking these two fingers out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but he's legit. Like he's you know he's more legit than I am in his musical world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the thing about surfaces and distances, I did a drum clinic on this not too long ago because I think it's something that people don't talk about. It's like if you, if you study violin, your violin kind of looks like a violin your whole life. Yeah. You know, it's going to be the same notes. It's going to be under the same part of your chin. I mean, you can have another violin that feels a little bit different, but you're still playing the violin, mm-hmm. you know. And pianos, if they have 88 keys, they're all 88 key pianos. They might feel a little different if you get a Yamaha or a Steinway or a Bosendorfer or whatever, but they're all pianos. But a drum set is like just this weird collection of stuff. And it's all at different heights and different tensions and different materials. And not only is your drum set always different, but your drum set is different from someone else's drum set. And it's just odd that there's no uniform way to really tune or set up a drum set. There is that kind of four piece thing that people do with, this you know, it, kick, yeah. kick snare, hi hat rack floor with a ride that, that mm-hmm. is sort of standard, but that's not even a rule. But beyond that, I mean, there's different seat heights, different pedal tensions there. Every element of drumming is wide open and subjective, which is super cool, but also weird if you're trying to, be analytical about what you do sure you know so um part of this drum clinic i did at one point was just understanding the distances of your kit knowing that you know going from your hi-hat to your floor tom or your left crash to your right crash is going to take a certain amount of time it's different than going from your whatever your rack to your snare or yeah you know you have different heights you're dealing with different angles different distances so I, I call that distance control or distance management is what I call it. So when I sometimes when I'm warming up, what I really am warming up is I'm just moving around my kit and getting a clear picture of how far everything is, how quickly it takes me to do eighth notes or 60 notes and get from one part of my kit to another very efficiently and in time in the grid, you know. And I don't know if a lot of people work on that, but I work on that because mm-hmm. I want to I want to play in time. So, uh, and yeah, I think that's something that people need to work on really internalize those motions of what it takes to go from your 18 inch floor, Tom, to the crash symbol over your hi hat, you know, and how far that is. And if you're going to go back and forth, how quickly you have to move to get there in that space of time, you know? Right. And you are in tune enough with it that you can tell. Oh yeah. Well you practice it, you practice it and you record yourself and you're like, if you have a, a, a recording device and you rec- record, you're like, I notice that my crashes are late when mm-hmm. I do this, or I drag this, or I rush this, or if you're if you're into this type of thing, which is it goes back to what we we're talking about before, like what I actually the stuff I practice is it seems super boring, but it's very practical because it helps me in recordings. Is knowing that as I move around my kit, if I'm doing quarters, eighths, triplets, sixteenth notes. I know that they're all going to land at the right times and and no one's going to have to punch anything in or move anything later because they're all going to land in the right spots. Um, and it just takes a lot of practice. You know, it's, you know, it's, it'd be like, um, 
I don't know, like if you're a kid and I don't know if you know what hopscotch is, you know, that oh, game. Yeah. Where, where, yeah. And imagine like if you have to jump from like the one to the 10 and back to the one and then the one to the two and the one to the three. If you're jumping around those kind of distances, you start to learn that, you know, wow, if I'm and imagine now trying to do that in time. Yeah. Like I, with in quarter notes, you know, I'm going to jump to the one to the two, the one to the two, the one to the 10, the one to the two, you know, and you start to get used to this thing like, oh, I can do this in time, but it takes different motions and different muscles and, you know, different, you know, uh, spring out of my legs to make this happen. And you can do this on the drum set, too, which I don't think a lot of people, they, they probably do it, but they don't think that they're, they don't think about doing it. They're not consciously practicing that. I do. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I I would say that I'm certainly aware of, but it hadn't occurred to me um, to do that. One thing that Isaiah Skill told me that he got from you or that you had talked to him about also was like holding your stick in a different spot depending on whether you want to be like on top of the beat or for different styles. Of, am I getting that right? Uh, you know what? I, I listened to the first half of his uh, podcast. I haven't Did got you? that part yet. Yeah. yeah, I didn't get to that part yet, but uh, he's a sweetheart. Yeah, right? but um, I I've given him like maybe, I don't know, maybe like two lessons or something over the years, and we've hung a bunch. I don't know if I said that, but I definitely d did go through a period where I would hold the stick differently to get a different mood. Mm -hmm. Like I would choke up on the stick to play a certain way, to play a little more mechanical. Uh -huh. I would pull back on the stick a little bit to get more length or laid back a feel or something and i would i would definitely experiment with different grips to change the f sound and feel of the music i was going through mm -hmm. if i wanted to be like if i wanted to play in like like a joy division kind of sounding mechanical beat i would hold the sticks differently than if i was to do something really uh like smooth and acoustic and like folky blues, or something yeah. so i i don't only hold the sticks in one fashion you know, I hold them in probably at least a half dozen ways, depending on my mood and and what I'm trying to, I guess, I guess get across. You know, sure. So that that might have been what we talked about. It, okay, and um, when when you say you know, would would those be like you've got a half dozen different standard things that you go to, or you're like there are probably this many variations? Uh, I don't consciously go through them like uh like a like a rolodex but i yeah. think i if i have a practice pad and i'm like just i have it on a desk and i'm playing i won't hold the sticks one way for 15 minutes i'll i'll like i'll hold them five minutes one way and then i'll just switch oh now i'm gonna hold them thumb off french grip for a while mm -hmm. and then i'll then i'll hold them like german grip but with the fulcrum between my thumb and my index finger and now mm -hmm. i'm gonna change the fulcrum between my thumb and my middle finger you know, it just the different fulcrums and I'll hold it more toward the tips of my fingers and then I'll hold them more toward the second uh, digit of my finger. And I'll, and I'll choke really far back sometimes where I'm barely holding on to the butt ends of the sticks. Yep. Uh, I play traditional and matched. So I'll just go through all that, not really thinking much about it, just trying to get my hands comfortable with the uh, sticks, like if, as if I were like some kind of you know, Bruce Lee with nunchucks or something, just trying to get comfortable and not really thinking about it too much. Yeah. Just making sure that whatever I can do with one grip, I can also do with another grip. It's sure. not like, oh, this is the only one where I can do a double stroke roll. You know, I don't want it to be that. I want like whatever I want to do, I can do it with any of the grips. And now I'm just flowing through them all. But it's not like I'm doing it like as a trick or something or to be able to show off. It's just, I just want to be able to pick up the sticks and just make them do what I want no matter what. Yeah. You know? And, and, and be comfortable, like no matter what kind of bounce it takes or whatever. Sure. Um, yeah. In yeah. fact, that's something I've been working on lately is getting more of, I, a long time ago, I was really into all the whole molar thing and these huge motions and very big, like almost bullwhip looking motions, like lifting from the elbows. And I still like that. But what I'm into right now is that like barely moving your, shoulder bicep forearm and everything is from the wrist down you know yep. but getting a lot of power mm -hmm. like not like like tap 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 but being able to really hit hard and and get a lot of notes out with just that wrist snap you know and, and is that uh, that's go ahead so i was gonna say is that uh force or is it like 
totally like like Zen physics? Um. Uh, I guess it's like it's just like a more um, efficient motion. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do something similar to what I would do with a full molar stroke, but I'm trying to do it without all the wasted motion. Yep. You know, I'm not trying to be stiff and tight about it. I'm still trying to be super loose, but I just want this power to be like, you know, almost like if you were going to take a basketball and throw it across a court, you'd probably throw it one way, right? You'd probably throw it, hold it way behind your head and then swing it as hard as you could to try to get it across the court, right? And then if I were going to stand uh, two feet away from the wall and try to bounce it a hundred times against the wall, I would go. It's a little more like that, like that kind of like power, quick motion, because I guess if I think about it, what I'm really working on is I want to have both my in sports and in in exercise. They talk about fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. And how athletes, you know, have both and they have to work on both. They're two different muscle groups in your body. And if I were to be super generalistic, I would say that I've, I've got the slow twitch muscle thing down pretty well. And the fast twitch muscle, I want to get better. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys who can uh, like, I don't want to like name names as far as like try to stereotype people's playing. But if you watch someone like uh, Nate Smith play, you ever mm-hmm. watch his like, I mean, yeah. he's got that fat, what I consider that fast twitch muscle. All the down. like, yeah, that one handed 16 note stuff. And it's yeah. just like, oh, it's just burning. And I love it. And I'm like, I play a lot looser and more spacious than that. And that's cool, but I don't want to. I want to play like him. So, right. I, so I'm actually like working on making sure that my fast twitch muscle groups are also in check and not tight and tense, but really loose and powerful, you know? Right. That is interesting. That's something I hadn't thought about because I know I certainly have a a top speed and I hadn't really known what to attribute that to. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are certainly um, terms that I've heard. So are you now consciously developing those muscles according to art? Like, are you coming up with stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. Here's, here's a good example. Like, um, Here's a good example. So I love Tony Williams. I've said it before. I love all that fast ride cymbal stuff he used to do uh, with the Miles Davis quintet. Mm-hmm. If you don't play up-tempo jazz for quite a while and then you sit down to do it, it feels like you're running through quicksand. It's just like, oh, my God. It's got to be so I, controlled. It's just like, if you, I, mean, I don't know, if, you play in a, in a, if you're in Rage Against the Machine for a year – and yeah. then you go sit in at a, at a hotel at a jazz gig and you try to play, you know, something like Cherokee, you're going to die. Yeah. You have you have been playing the drums for a year and your chops are together, but you just haven't been doing ting 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 Yep. in your wrist and your fingers and your hands and controlling that bounce. So then you can sit around and just work on that only. You know, ting 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 to the point where that is so easy for you and you can crank up the speed. It could take hours, it could take days, it could take weeks, who knows, depending on your ability. But you can work on that. And you just see it happen like right before your eyes. You're like, "Oh my god, it's coming together." Yeah, like, like magic. this is amazing. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get past 140, and now I'm at 180. This is great, you know. And so I think that can happen with all sorts of beats and rhythms that you're working on. You just have to actually sit down and dedicate yourself to it. And what and why I bring up the jazz ride thing is because I think we all know that part of getting that together is being loose, mm-hmm. you know, and not being super stiff and forcing those bounces out, but actually going ting, 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 and like controlling the bounce. And I think if there's some other things you want to work on, like say you want to work on up-tempo drum and bass or a fast James Gadsden kind of one-handed 16th note groove, I believe you have to work on it with the same idea and not try to just muscle it out and say, oh, I can only get to 98 BPM. Ugh. You know, really like say, okay, I can get it to 98 BPM. Now, let me relax even more. Let mm-hmm. me 
let me like uh let me let me get my my let me figure out what's going on in my forearm let me figure out what's going on my wrist and my fingers and then oh now i'm up to 100 now i'm up to 104 try it again the next day now i'm up to 106 and you start to see like you're developing the right motions muscles and bounce control to play to play that rhythm like you would another rhythm and what again what's weird about the drum set is that they're, it's they're all different animals like to be able to play a fast up tempo swing is different than being able to play a a fast 16th note uh, thing on a closed hi hat you know mm -hmm. it's it's a different different motion that you're reaching you're crossing it's different you know and i think these are all things to work on if you want to and this is kind of what i'm fascinated with right now is just being able to to power out a bunch of fast notes but without tension with very like very loose um you know, uh, you know, tension free style drumming, but be able to power that stuff out and not weak, but actually getting volume and, and force out of it, you know? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> if I may, how are you, um, what are you, what are you doing to develop that? Like, are you, are you practicing it slowly? Are you like stopping when you feel tension? Is it all of it? Do you want to divulge this stuff? Oh man, it's so many things. But uh, let's see. If I told you all the things I'm working on right now, this would take hours. <laughs> but let me. But let me. Let, I'll. I'll just try to divulge some epiphanies. Um, here's one. Okay. I have a feeling that if you're a right-handed drummer, I uh -huh. have a feeling that your right hand is more developed than your left. That's Absolutely. obvious. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that already. But how developed is it? It's not just. It's not just it can play faster. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in all ways, it's probably better. Mm -hmm. You know, your your right hand is a black belt and your left hand is a white belt in like in this drumming. And they're and um and I'm and that's because so much of the stuff we practice, your right hand is being asked to do so much more than your left hand. So if your right hand is going like ding ding to ding ding to ding ding to ding ding to ding 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 ding, your left hand's going boom, you know, it's just it doesn't have the chance to catch up ever. Yeah. And then we go on these practice pads and we come up with rudiments, whatever. But I think it's not the same as being on the drum set and doing this stuff. So I'm not saying that you have to be Simon Phillips and do everything ambidextrously, but. For instance, one thing I like to do is to play like Latin cowbell patterns, right? I'll play like, you know, ting, ting, ta ting, ting, ta ting, ta ting, ta ting, ting, ta ting, ting, ta ting, ta ting. Okay. And maybe fill in the ghost notes with your left hand. That's the Mozambique cowbell pattern, right? But now, right hand on the rack tom, left hand on the snare, playing ghosts, right? So it's not a cowbell pattern. Now you're playing it on the on the tom. Cool. Switch your hands and do it. Left hand lead. It's gonna feel like a train wreck at first. You know, just first doing the accents with your left hand and doing ghost notes with your right hand is already a little weird. Yep. Right. And then also you'll start to realize, wow, it's not nearly as accurate. It's not going to tang to tang. It's going to da, 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 all yeah. the doubles. So, and then another thing you'll notice is, God, the tone isn't even the same. My right hand is big and open. And my left hand, when I play it on a rack tom, because the rack tom is when you play it this way, it's, it's much more, it's much less forgiving than a cowbell. You're like, wow, I'm not even getting a good tone out of the drum when I do this. So I'll take a beat like that and I'll play like, one bar with my right hand up on the rack and, one, and my left hand playing goes and I'll switch it back and forth. So ding, 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 switch left hand, ding, 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 switch, ding, ding, back and forth until they sound the same. And that way I know that I'm, I'm getting a similar technique out of both hands. I'm getting a similar tone. I'm not, one of my hands isn't loose and one of my hands isn't super tight and pinching the sticks, you know, like if you go back and forth that way on a, on a very unforgiving sound, like an open snare or a rack tom, you'll start to hear that. So for me, one thing that's helped a lot is getting a lot of 
notes that come out of things like rack toms and floor toms. You know, it's you get a lot of bounce out of cymbals. You don't get a lot of bounce out of a rack tom or floor tom. So a lot of my ex exercises involve moving around and getting a lot of notes that come out of my floor tom and my rack tom. And that's really helping me pull the notes out, you know, still keeping my hands very low. I'm not swinging like for the fences. My, my, my arms are kind of low, but I'm pulling a lot of notes and a lot of volume out now. That's one thing I like to do. Wild. I mean, there's, I, I have probably have, I don't know, four dozen other things, but yeah. that's just one that popped into my head that I like to do. Yeah. Um, so what is does a typical, like now that you're not touring, um, you, you presumably have, um, a lot more time to practice. How, how many minutes or hours a day would you currently be practicing? Um, so my main gig right now is I have an eight year old son and I take care yeah. of him. So, and he doesn't go to school now because of the the virus. So right. he, he's homeschooled like via like, you know, uh, like virtual Zoom school. school or whatever. Zoom school. So I yeah. basically get up and uh, I get up at like 530 in the morning and I do my own thing. Like I go for a jog and get a cup of coffee and read a, a little bit of a book. And then I start him around 8 a.m. with breakfast in school. And then he goes from 8 to 130 every day. Mm -hmm. And I kind of hang out with him so he can have lunch and I can correct his math or something. And, um, and then about one 30, I start to either work on some practicing or recording in my studio. So either I have a recording project to work on, or if I don't, that's mm -hmm. practice time. Mm -hmm. So it's usually the recordings come first. And if I don't have something to record, then I'll say time to shed. And, um, the things I've been working on lately, um, I set up a beep. It's not here today. I, I packed it up, but I set up a bebop kit two weeks ago, like just 12, 14, 18 wide open cranked. And I'm just having so much fun playing that, you know, uh, just really working on, uh, flowing around the kit and, um, doing a lot of odd groupings, lots of fives, triplets and fives, triplets and sevens. That's been a lot of fun for me. I also, um, I love working on triplets right now. I'm really into the second partial of the triplet, that whole vibe, like mm -hmm. really, you know, it's got to, it's got to, it's got to, it's got to really yeah. getting good with that, you know, being able to hear it and play it everywhere. Um, but what other things am I working on? Um, I, I do this exercise now where I'll sit and, um, I, where I'm talking to you right now is my computer yeah. and I'll sit there on and either use logic or Ableton and I'll just program a groove for like 15 minutes. And then I'll play to that groove and I don't use a click track. I use a click track to program it, but I don't, I think as drummers, we're so used to practicing with click tracks. I love practicing click tracks, right? But what if we just program a bass line, you know, and then we play with the bass line for an hour? You know, it's kind of fun because it's a little more realistic and it's a little more like what you'd be hearing on a stage. Um, so I'll just practice. I'll come up with some bass line and I'll play along with it or I'll warm up to it or I'll even solo on top of it, you know, and it's, it's a little more fun than soloing on top of quarter note clicks, you know? Sure. That's something I've been doing lately. And uh, if you're using Ableton or MIDI, you could speed it up and slow it down. So I'll just do yeah. this at 98 for now. And then I'm going to go up to 108 and the same thing and see how it feels and see how your groupings feel really horrible at different BPMs. Maybe you're, you're amazing at playing six tuplets at one BPM. And then at another BPM, it just falls apart and you can't find beat one. So you're like, oh, I got to get better at playing fives in groups of in triplets and groups of fives at this tempo because I start to lose beat one, you know? So you start to find all these weaknesses. The thing I love to practice more than anything is to find weaknesses in my playing and attack them. You know, I, I don't need to play what I already play. Well, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't need that. You know, what I need to do is to play, play, play until I discover something that feels awkward. I'm like, Ooh, that felt a little awkward. Let me, let me get into that a little more, you know, let me, let me see what, what was weird about that. Is it the tempo? Is it the, is it the grouping? Is it the, the whatever? And then I just dive into that until it no longer feels weird to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the stuff I like to practice. So, um, when you say, um, triplets in fives and sevens, wh what do you mean specifically? Okay. Yeah. So, 
I'll break it down. So triplets and groups of three is uh-huh. what we all know. Taka the taka the taka the taka the triplets and groups of two is taka the taka the taka 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 you know taka. Oh right, you're you're hitting that. The rhythm is still a triplet, but you're accenting the taka 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 taka. Triplets and groups of fours is when you start getting exotic. Yeah. That's usually where people stop in their yeah. practice. But doing fives. Oh, sorry, I can't even. I have to play it. I can't sing it. I'm I know not an mean. Indian drummer. Yeah. But yeah, you, you start to play like. You know, that's that's triplets and groups of fives. Six, as we know, sevens, I'm sorry, that's nines, but yeah. yeah, yeah so, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I just practice those on the kit constantly, and it really, really, but every sticking you can think of, too, not just one sticking, every way, and it really helps you kind of... Um, like not fall into the the old patterns. It really opens up your your ears and your stickings and where beat one is for you. And it's mm. it's it's great. It's great. And are you looking to develop? Like, is it about the pattern specifically, or is it more about um, opening things up? You know it's what about, I mean. It's about freedom. It's yeah. not about it's not about licks. It's not about uh, coming up with something like, "Ooh, I'm going to use that. That's going to be my new lick." It's definitely not. It's the opposite. It's mm-hmm. I am trying to get rid of anything that ever sounds like a lick to me. Yep. So it so I have the I have the entire freedom to improvise on the drums and play whatever I want, you know, and not be restricted to groupings or or, you know, stickings or fills that I've played in the past. Mm-hmm. We all have them and that's fine. Steve Gadd has them and I love them. Every Steve Gadd like is is like is like gold to me. Sounds but, so good. Yeah. But uh, but what I want is my my goal is to keep on hacking away at my tendencies until they're no longer tendencies. Mm-hmm. Till like till like I have this wide open, um, uh, kind of like almost reservoir of vocabulary that totally. is so so wide that it it doesn't sound like I'm playing anything uh, that was like uh thought out you know it's totally you know just open well so the ideas are flowing through and they're not they're not passing through any kind of restrictions mm-hmm. um now also i'm curious when you say um so you're doing that you're using different stickings are you methodically cycling through or is it more like the grip thing where you're you're uh, like you'll do one and then this feels you, you know oh, what i mean or is it like two minutes, this one yeah it's in the beginning if you've never played triplets and fives, you'll get lost. Yeah. If you've never heard that sound, you're like, oh, so you have to do something to make it very easy for you. So you have to do something, either a sticking, uh-huh. right, left, right, left, left, or make a, a tonal thing, like, I don't know, like uh, floor tom, floor tom, floor tom, snare, snare, or something, like something that you can hold on to that'll allow you to not get lost in this sea of notes, right? Yeah. Either it's a sticking or, or a sound. And then, and then you start to hear it move over the bar line. You're like, oh, I get it. Now I can feel it. Then you can start changing it up and doing any sticking you want because you're not going to get lost anymore. In right. the beginning, though, even I, in the beginning, I have to hold on to something at first. I, yeah. I, I'm, like, I'm like holding on to a flagpole in the wind. And I'm like, help, help me. Where's one? And then you get used to it. You're like, I'm not lost anymore. I know exactly where I am. Now it's time to improvise. Now I can play whatever I want. So – what I do now is I don't – I say fives and sevens and triplets. That's not what I'm working on. What I'm really working on is playing singles and doubles in any combination, in any uh, denomination. You know, and I can play 16th notes, triplets, sextuplets, eighth notes, and I can play them in doubles or singles in any grouping, and it doesn't matter anymore. There is no more name. We've taken away the names of paradiddles and paradiddle diddles and inverted paradiddles and, you know, all, and doubles. We're now we're now erasing that. We're just going tap 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 tap
it starts to melodies start to poke out like oh that's not a lick that's a melody that's coming out of the kit now because i'm i'm playing right left left right left left and that's that is a lick but i didn't mean to do that that's just a melody now right left left right left left you know right so what i'm trying to do is getting to the point where i'm not thinking i'm going to do a bar of paradiddles then i'm going to do a bar of doubles it's like what i'm trying to do is get to the point where my hands and feet play comfortable with any combination of singles and doubles. So I not only do I do it with my hands, but then I start doing it with my feet, uh, my right foot and my and my right hand, and my right foot and my left hand. I'll treat it the same way you would do doubles and paradiddles between your right and left hand. I'll do it between my right foot and my left hand. So, you know, you know, but every combination you know that until mm -hmm. it sounds bizarre but i'm now improvising with singles and doubles and then you can do that with your hands and your feet and then all of a sudden all new sorts of melodies are popping out there and you're surprising yourself even like i've never played that before today and that just came out because of the combination that was happening there because and, um, you, you've never had it available before yeah because it wasn't pre-thought out it's not like yeah. i read that in a book and i'm gonna go practice that it's yeah. that that just happened with the flow of notes i was go i was cycling through uh -huh. i was cycling through it and i don't even know what that was that was two kicks it was one right hand on the floor and that was two lefts on the snare so that is a five so it's boom boom boom, chi -chi, boom, boom, boom chi -chi. okay i got mm -hmm. it i never i never played that before today but that's what happened you know and you keep on practicing this and at first it's awkward you trip up a lot you come out on the wrong beat, you lose one sometimes, and you just keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it. And then you go through not only 16 notes, but you got to go to eighth notes, you got to go to triplets, you got to go six tuplets, back and forth, back and forth, kind of cycling through all the different subdivisions. And then now you're just coming up, you're becoming a master of, of just rhythm and control of, of the drum set, you know? That's what I'm practicing. <laughs> That's so it's amazing, hard to explain. man. It's hard to explain, but because it's like it's long road, but um, it's coming along. Uh, <laughs> it's coming along. Um, um, man, the um, the 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 uh, discipline and dedication that you've got to have just to what what motivates you to keep going. Um, I definitely love the drums. Mm -hmm. Like, it, like it's that kind of thing where if I, uh, a great uncle passed away and gave me, you know, 17 tassels and I never had to work another day in my life, I would still do this. I would yeah. still do exactly this, you know? Um, I, I really love drums. I love playing them. I love practicing them. I love playing with other people. I, I uh -huh. love doing all sorts of gigs, bar gigs, coffee shop gigs, tours. I love it all. So that hasn't gone away, surprisingly, over all these years. I've never gotten that whole jaded thing where I'm like, fuck the music business. This sucks. <laughs> I, I still love drums so much. And uh, it's very gratifying for me to sit down for an hour and a half or two hours on the drums and then walk away with an improvement, any type yeah. of improvement. You know, it's um, – and so – there's that, and then there's what. Well, another thing that mot motivates me is other great drummers. Mm -hmm. I see other great drummers, and fortunately, a lot of them are my friends now, which is even cooler. And you I are see in them. one of the center, the global centers. Yeah, and then it's not. It's also it. It just goes to show how cool drummers are. You know, like mm -hmm. that someone I thought would be like a legend and wouldn't even talk to me is now we have I mean, we text each other stupid jokes. You know, so it's kind of cool to reach that level. And but also what they do inspires me. It could be yeah. a completely different style of drumming from what I do, but I love what they do. So then I'm like, wow, if I can take just 10% of what he's doing and add it to my arsenal, that's going to be great. You know, I don't have to sound like him. I just want to take his touch or I want to take his, his phrasing or I want to take whatever thing that's really, that really sparkles about one of my friends drumming. I want to take just a, just a little, just pinch off a little bit of that uh -huh. and put it in my little bag. And, and that's good enough for me. You know, I don't want to be a clone of that guy. I just love that the way that guy plays shuffles, or I love the way that guy, you know, plays these fills and never hits the crash on beat one. That's so hip. I'm not going to do that either anymore. You know, something like that. I just steal something from all my friends all the time. And, and 
and it's I guess surrounding yourself with really great inspirational drummers helps me a lot. Uh huh. Um, I don't know what else. Um, I still think I like I have a lot of room to grow and a lot to give back. Like not only do I think I could be a lot better of a drummer and I have a, I don't know, a, I still feel like I have 10, 20 years ahead of me in my career. I also feel like at a certain point, I want to turn this around and just start pouring it back at other drummers. But I really want to have my, I want to have stuff together. So I have a lot to give uh-huh. and I don't want to have half baked concepts. I want to have like fully <laughs> <Sure>. baked concepts <laughs> that I can give back to people and say, look, it took me a long time to get this together and I can show you how I got that together now. Yeah. You know, it's not like, not like, ah, I'm working on this thing and I can't really do it that well, but let me show it to you. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to have a lot of things, a lot of interests. I want to have them so well cooked that I can now give it back to people that are in their teens or twenties or thirties and say, look, take this, take this and run with it. You know? Well, it also is, um, you know, I, I think part of that too is, like part of part of mastering it is um understanding the context and like why you know it's one thing to be like here you should work on this because it's probably good but like i've developed this thing i know it um here is why you should do it or you know why you could do it you know i I think it's just a that's a more more holistic view of um yeah i i do teach you know, decent amount of drum lessons. And a Mm -hmm. lot of my lessons are, I don't really teach a curriculum, not yet at least. Uh, But what I really like to do is more like, you know, drum whisperer kind of teaching, which is someone (laughs) comes over and we just chill for like 10 minutes and we talk about stuff. And then I ask them, so what are you working on? Or what are you having a hard time with? You know, and it could be, we can talk about psychology or emotion, or we can talk about a, you know, a left hand issue or whatever. And I really want to spend the rest of the hour coming up with things that are going to help you, you know, break through that hurdle that you're having either, Mm -hmm. you know, what are you practicing or what gig are you auditioning for? Or what gig are you doing right now? Or what thing are you having a hard time with? Or what are you really interested in? And let's work on that. And I, I really think that I'm pretty good at coming up with exercises on the spot to help people with whatever their problem is. Oh, you're having a problem with that? Try this. You're having a problem with that? Try this. You know, and I like doing that. But by doing that for enough time, I realize eh, maybe I should write this stuff down because maybe a lot of people are having the same issues. I used to just come up with like an exercise for one of my students and say, mm-hmm. you're having this issue, work on that. You're having this issue, work on that. And then it was actually by the suggestion of one of my students who said, Hey man, you should write all this stuff down. This is, this is gold. And I'm like, no, it's just for you. He's like, but man, I bet all the other guys have the same question. They just haven't asked it. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, I guess. So then I started making PDFs of all this stuff that I show different people. But, um, yeah, again, it's like you said, I want to make sure that it's, it works. It works for me and it works for other people and it would, it would work for their, you know, their futures, you know, it would be, if they worked on this stuff, it would actually have a reason, uh, in their playing, you know, it would actually make their playing better, not just some exercise. Mm-hmm. We're, we're filled with exercises. I don't know. You know, I think like exercises that have a, a like an end goal, you know, I, I like those better. Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have to agree. Um, but this also makes me wonder. So in, the, you know, part of it is the, um, um, perhaps you wouldn't think to write it down because you're like, well, this is just obvious. This is just what you would do. Um, but it's it's obvious to you because it's like it, it's your own uh, brain and approach. But I'm also curious. So when you are practicing, um, is it all totally like based on analysis of your own playing? Are you working on? Um, do you work on exercises that you've gotten somewhere, or is it all completely at this point about like? What are the weak spots? How can I get at them? What am I interested in? What am I motivated by? Oh, or is it know, everything? It's, it's everything, but yeah, it's it it's it's everything because it's what you said. I'm looking for weaknesses in my playing, but I can find that out through someone else's book or mm-hmm. someone else's DVD or something. Uh, I don't know if you know a drummer named Carter McLean. I don't. Okay, he's a he's a drummer out of New York. And uh, I was in New York one one day, and we got a cup of coffee, and he and we're just ta- we're just talking about drums, like drummers do. 
yeah. and he was just showing me this little exercise he dub he does with doubles and just playing right right left left right right left left but putting the accents all over the place like you know not just on a downbeat but putting them all over the place in groups of fives and sevens i'm like i've never done that mm -hmm. you know, it sounds so simple but i've never done that so I started working on it and I'm like, and I went home and I just started working on every permutation you can think of, of that. I think I called him up like a month later saying, I got it. I got this and I got, <laughs> and I can do it backwards. And I can do it with the left hand lead. I can do it in triplets. I can, he goes, dude, I'm not even doing that. I just do it just regular. I'm like, but I just got fixated with the idea that yeah. I couldn't do this. It seems so simple, but I've never, it's not like I couldn't do it. It's like, I never thought of doing this before. Uh huh. So, um, and I, I really, I just went home with this like excitement to go practice it. And um, yeah, so that happens. It happens from friends. It happens from seeing someone play. It happens from them. My point is, okay, I was going to say he put out a book and it's in his book. So you can, people can go buy it now, but he showed me this before it was in a book form. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I could, I can, yeah, I can get it out of a book out of an instructional, or I can just get it from, from jamming myself and, and having a hiccup and saying, Whoa, what was that? What, mm -hmm. what was that weird flub I just did, you know, or it can happen from watching a drummer and saying, well, I'm not getting everything he's doing, but I've noticed some tendencies. He, he groups things this way, or he's mm -hmm. doing this cool thing. And then maybe I'd, I'm not imitating him exactly, but I'll go home and work on that. You know, like, uh, you know, every year, um, Mark Juliana and Zach Danzer could put on a show here in January in, in LA. And I go out and see, they've done it like, four or five years in a row and I go hang out at that and I watch them and I, I might not get every single note that they're playing every night, but I go and I take all those concepts and I practice for a month straight, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you don't have to really get things note for note sometimes if you're just taking home, you know, the idea of what they're trying to do, you know, like I like what they're doing. I like this kind of thing that they're doing and you go work on your own version of that, you know? Mm -hmm. And ultimately it has to function in your own life anyway. I mean, it's like yeah. the thing you're talking about before, which um, your 20s, sure, you can you can copy people, but at a certain point, it's like you have to be developing your thing. So you're ultimately, even when it's inspired by or, you know, you're, you're taking little bits of uh, inspiration or pieces of uh, things that people are doing, it's still all it can do is inform what you're already doing. Like, have you ever gone like, have you ever gone to see like a stand up comedy show? Yeah. Like live ever. I mean, imagine if like five guys come out and they all look exactly the same and they all sound exactly the same and they do each one does a set and they're different jokes, but they all have the same outfit on and the same like rhythm and the same topics. And you're like, after the first one and the first two, you're like, wow, are all five guys going to sound this way? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love Louis C.K. Do I need to see five Louis C.K.'s in one night? Yeah. I don't know if that – I mean, I, it's the variety that you want to see when you go see a live stand-up comedy thing. You know, the opener was different than the closer. and but uh, So I think that idea of, like, really, really honing in on who you are and what you do, and I think comedians have to do that because they're so naked up there. They really, it's... really have to do something to set themselves apart, which is be yourself, you know? Yeah, and be a be a heightened version of yourself is what they learn how to do, and I think drummers can learn from that. They can say, you know, I could try to be a copy of these three dudes, or I can just try to find who I am and try to be like the heightened, you know, version of that, like the the very well rehearsed, very well practiced, you know, excellent version of that person might be better than a half-assed version of these other three dudes, you know. They're already doing it and they're already doing it better. And and you're right. It's like by the time you get to the fifth one, it's like, shoot me. I don't need more of this. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I did also, um, just uh, as a point of curiosity, I did a workshop. It was called Red Nose Clown um, once. But the entire idea is that laughter is involuntary. Um, so it was a, a theater guy. My, my friend um, who's like an actor and a theater guy um, was hosting this thing. But this guy had studied it in France with, um, I don't remember the, the teacher's name, but he's like developed this method. And so you actually do like wear a red clown nose for part of it. But it's about improvisation. And yeah, the idea is that a laugh is like, it's kind of an expression of surprise. It can't be like you, you it can't be forced. It can't be really drawn out. It, it has to catch people honestly. And so the whole thing was like, here's a scenario 
um, and you have to create a laugh like within the the constraints of it. And it was fun. I get, kept getting caught up in what he called the idiot laugh, which is like you're just like giggling because you're nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but it was funny because it is exactly that. I know the first time I saw a stand up show, I was really struck by that, which is like it, they are so naked up there. Like the show is this guy talking into a microphone like that's all. If he decides that he can't hack it, like there's just no show. If he, you know stumbles for whatever reason it's no one's come to save him um but it um i think like inspiration um is the same and that and that is also why the 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 copycat thing doesn't work and uh, um yeah it's it, it it's it's so uh so interesting what you're saying because i think also it's like it passes through somebody else is going to put it through their own filter and so inevitably it's going to not be what you would come up with, but that's what makes it interesting. I don't know. It's funny. It's like the, cause the compulsion to, to copy can be so strong because it feels like a, like a safety thing. Mm -hmm. But, and also like, also it feels like that guy's really good. He must have the answers. <laughs> those must be, those must be the right answers. You know, well, he's really good and he has, some answers yeah but, you know those aren't the answers no he has you his know, answers like, yeah it's like you might see a fantastic drummer play and you're like he's he's flawless he's the way you have to play you know well yeah he's flawless he's not the way you have to play though you know it's you can play somewhere some other way and also be flawless you know yeah i, I have i have a few guys who are like my top five or top ten drummers and they all play differently and that's what's cool like it's not like i love one guy and eight other guys that sound like that guy it's like uh -huh. i like that guy and i like this other guy who sounds totally different and but it's something about their the genuine uh approach to drumming and their masterful uh, um approach to drumming that i love and it does has nothing to do with how they sound compared to someone else you know comparison is terrible you know um yeah who um i'm curious now um who would be in your top five or top ten well, there's the obvious choices. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, I will never not like John Bonham. Agreed. You know, John John Bonham is he wrote the he wrote the Bible on rock and roll drumming, and uh -huh. like he had a great combination of parts, feel, groove, swing. You know, everything is is to me great, uh, and of the era. Um, I love Stuart Copeland, the police mm -hmm. stuff. Huge, huge, huge fan. Um, I love Steve Gadd. He mm -hmm. to me is the like prototypical, like perfect drummer, like who he is, his sound, his feel, his, his career. Like he's one of those very few guys who can exist on both planes where he's respected as a songwriter, player, drummer, session guy, and also respected as a drum clinician, you know, fusion. You want to see him do solos too. Yep. I can't think of many drummers who are actually respected highly in both realms. He's one. Sure. So, yeah, um, yeah. he's, he's on there. Tony Williams, uh, both his old Miles Davis quintet swing era. And then everything he did after that, which is just, just balls, mm -hmm. just total balls. Like is like, there's that, uh, lifetime era. And then there's that kind of eighties, nineties era where he had that quartet i mean that quintet but it was like a loud power quintet yeah um i just he was just awesome um i'm a huge brian blade fan oh um, um, yeah beautiful just something spiritually uplifting about his drumming it's like yep. i feel nothing but joy listening to him his his uh what do you call it the um the fellowship records that he has his solo yep. records but then everything he does if he's on it I just start smiling and I feel good. If there's some soul behind his drumming that is intangible, I love his playing. And uh, it goes on and on, but those are like yeah. the guys who jump in my head right now. Like I could listen to just them the rest of my life probably. Yeah, and you would you would have it pretty well covered, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there might be stuff that you don't hear, but um, that's a lot. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I've got to jump off. Um, you've given me so much to think about. You've been so generous with your time. I really no appreciate problem. it. No problem. This um, is fun. Yes. Um, one final question I have for you is uh, drummer plus drummer. What's the deal? 
Oh, thanks for asking. That I just started. Well, okay, here that's a great question because I'm not really good at ever advertising anything I do. Uh, despite my constant rambling on this podcast, I am quite a private person. <laughs> so everything I do is always like on a one-to-one basis with a buddy in person. But this is how I. This is why I can do this because like put me in a group and I won't talk. But like yeah. one-on-one, I will. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, you were asking why I didn't. Uh, come up with exercises for people and you're like, I wonder why that is, you know, when you're talking about teaching drum lessons and I was thinking in my head, it's because I was in a drum lesson with someone and I was thinking I'm here with you and these exercises are for you. Mm. It's not like I'm not in a drum lesson thinking I'm going to write you a lesson and then I'm going to release it to the planet. <laughs> it's like, that's <laughs> never my intention. It, What's I the McDonald's version? Like, yeah, uh, I don't have that gene in me. I don't want to, I don't want to reach the whole planet. I never, I, I just want to have a good connection with one person at a time. And uh-huh. it's, it's good and bad. It's good, but it's not great for, you know, social media purposes. But anyway, back to your question. I, about a year ago thought, um, you know what I want to do is I do all these pop gigs and, you know, click tracks. And what I, what I want to do is get together in a bar with a friend of mine another drummer, it could be any drummer, but a friend of mine who plays really well, sensitively, and just do like a set or two of double drumming. Mm-hmm. Like not double drumming, like, hey, you play eight bars, I'll solo, and then we'll right. switch. You know, like actually just set up two drum sets and just play with one another. Making you know? music and with two drum Making kids. music, just two drums. Yeah, Two drum sets, I mean. And you could be percussion, it could be mallets, it could be brushes, it could be anything. Mm-hmm. And I think if it were done really well, it would be listenable. You know, I think it would be enjoyable. And I think that, you know, and I don't want to do it in a jazz club where people's eyes are fixed and like impress me. I was thinking like some kind of like mezcal bar or something where people are already having a good time. Right. And in the corner, our two drummers just kind of grooving. Yeah. I think that would be fun. And I thought what would be really fun is to do a regular night where it's like the first Monday of every month. And then if a friend of mine were in LA on tour, he could come by and I could yep. say, Great. The drummer for so and so is in town, and he's going to do this Monday, and it'll be a rotating cast, you know, of me with this guy, me with this guy, this guy from London, this guy from New York, this guy from whatever Portland is in. Yep. And and so every month will be different, and I think it'll be fun for me. It'd be fun for the other drummers because maybe we can open up the last set and have anyone sit in, you know, so other drummers can come out and we can all kind of do this thing together. That was my idea, and then mm-hmm. COVID happened. Yeah, and then and then I'm like, well, that's not happening. There's no live music. There's no venues right now. So I I, I thought to myself, ah, maybe I could try to create this on Instagram. It won't be the same as what I want, but maybe I can try to create this. So I I reached out to a couple friends of mine and threw the concept around. Like, would you be cool doing this? And it's not going to be a whole like drum solo thing. It's just going to be like two drummers grooving together, but not playing the same beat. Like, let's yeah. not just play the same beat. Let's let's play music together. And so I did one last week with the drummer from Billie Eilish. Yeah. Uh, cause, and and that was fun. Uh, and I'm doing one this week with Carter, the guy who I mentioned before. And he already sent me two. I'm going to work on it tomorrow. And then next week, I'm going to do one with a drummer named Brian Griffin, who is the drummer for uh, Brandy Carlisle. I and, was going to uh, make a family just, guy joke. I'm sorry. Uh, um, and then I'm sure I basically, I, I have... Um, I have like a wish list of like, I don't know, maybe 20 drummers mm-hmm. and I'm just, I don't want to bother any of them. So I just want to do them little by little. And then when they, when they see what it is, then maybe they'll be like, Hey man, I'll do one. It, it takes one minute of my time. I'll do it. You know? Yeah. And then, and then it'll be this thing. That's just, it's like a, a little Instagram page for drummers to play with one another. And that's, that's kind of what, what I want to do. And it, it, I just started it literally less than a week ago. And, uh, but, uh, it's funny you should ask. So, and I'm, I'm going to work on one. I'm just trying to do one like every Monday, you know? And then, uh, and what I, my goal is that when this whole pandemic is over, this will turn into a night yeah. where like, where like, Hey, uh, if you're in LA, come by on Monday, we're doing a drummer plus drummer thing. And it's just like me and eight other drummers just hanging out and it's me and another guy. And then like maybe for the last set, everyone just switches, you know? So that's what I want. Uh, you know, something something local that's very drum oriented, but not like uh, 
like a guitar center drum off drum oriented more like, like melt your face kind of thing not not a, i love melt your face drumming too mm-hmm. but it, i don't want it to be that I, I want it to be a kind of thing where it's actually like you can kind of have a a whiskey and just chill out and, and just groove along you know um i mean someone who would be perfect for this would be a guy like jay belrose who plays in town he does a lot of local gigs he sounds amazing i don't know if he'd want to do it but you know mm-hmm. i what i have to do first is get drummers who actually have home studios you know so that's the thing is i i'm i'm, I'm narrowing it down to drummers who have home studios first you know who have the ability to record themselves uh and make it sound like kind of you know more a little more hi-fi and then is- send me a video yeah, this is what I was going to ask, is how you were able to do it, like, without a lag. Oh, yeah. So what I did was, it's, it's I'm not playing at the same time. What I do is, the first one I did was I, I called up my friend Andrew, and I said, hey, man, this is what I, here's my concept. It's not, it's not a, uh, a shed session. It's, mm-hmm. I just want you to groove. Just groove for, like, four minutes and send it back to me. And then I'm going to play on top of it, and I'm going to send it to you, and you tell me what you think. So that's what we did. And then, and then we did it and then we're like, cool, sounds great. And then I, I mix the two videos side by side and that's it. So I want to keep it that organic, organic, like as if we were sitting in a bar together, facing each other, 45 degree angles. And I say, you start something. And then a guy goes, I go, you know, something. And I just come in on top or vice versa. The next one's like, why don't you start something? And I go like, you know, whatever. Someone comes up with one tribal groove. Another guy comes in with a backbeat part or it could be brushes or it could be percussion or it could be like odd times. It could be anything. I don't want it to be produced. I want it to be like, just, just start playing. And then I'm going to come in with something contrapuntal that, that doesn't step all over you. And then the next one will be, I'll start something and you just come in with something. And I want it to be that way. So uh, that's the only way I can think of doing it virtually where it'll work is just me calling up a friend, telling them what I want and saying, record yourself playing the drums for like four minutes and send it over my way. I'm going to jam on top of it and send it back to you. You tell me if you like it. And that's it. Beautiful. Yeah. And hopefully someone else might like it. Well, I <laughs> but mean, again, I, Listening to it, I thought you guys were playing together. So that I'm, um, I mean, and you are, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. 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 So, I mean, and the idea is like, I hope drummers like it, but really what I wanted to do is I want to, I want people that are not drummers to say, oh, drums are, drums sound good. <laughs> drums are listenable. <laughs> you know, uh, drums are enjoyable. That's what I really want. I like, was going to you know, say, because that was your first I love that that was the bar for I think it would be listenable like <laughs> yeah because I mean I'll be honest I I know a lot of people who run away from like you know drum solos you know ah too many too many crashes you know but you know if it's something super groovy you know mm-hmm. uh, I think I think anyone can get into that people love tribal stuff you know and it, it, okay I used to live in Miami uh and I would play a lot with percussionists. It wasn't ever an issue. It wasn't like you had to talk about, don't step on me, or you do this, I do that. It's just, I would play, and then a percussionist would come in and do something entirely different, and it would somehow work. You know, it's very common. It's yeah. in the culture. It's in the mm-hmm. culture, and it's very danceable. It's not like someone comes in on top of me and just starts blazing timbali fills for an hour. It's yeah. like, no. You, I play, and someone comes in and grooves with me. That's what great percussionists do. Mm-hmm. And then I, and then on the flip side, I would do gigs with DJs where the DJ would start playing some 808 beats and I would come in with a drum set part that was not that part because yeah. why would I need to double it? It already sounds good through the PA. Let me come with something else. I'll, I'll play snare drum on beat one. Who knows? I'll just turn it around yeah. and it'll sound cool because it's now me playing along with that beat. So I don't think enough people have the experience or the concept of that where I was trying to like think like, I love that stuff. And I love when I see other people do that. And I think that makes it very listenable is it, it's like, it's that whole percussion way of approaching it. And uh, I mean, it, you, you live in, you go to enough Latin countries, you see a bunch of percussions get together and jam and it's danceable and enjoyable. And then you get two drum set players side by side. You're like, Oh my God, stop. <laughs> Will you stop doing that. I don't know why that happens. So I would like it to be a little more like that concept, you know? 
Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Jerry Grinelli, um, he's a... Uh, he, he's an old uh, jazz guy. Uh, he's from San Francisco originally, uh, best known for playing with the Vince Guaraldi trio, but he, he lives in Halifax here now. Um, and he does a free improvisation workshop. And uh, one of the things he talks about is playing together versus playing at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like the, the, the thing, the, the two drums, that thing you're describing sounds to me like playing at the same time, you know, like two yeah. guys independently soloing. Yeah, I didn't come up with this either. Like, this is just what I want to do because I live in LA and no one else is doing it in LA right now. But yeah, I yeah. saw a video of, uh, I can't remember cause I saw it a couple of years ago, but it might've been Ari Honig and Dan Weiss. Mm-hmm. There's two, two jazz drummers in New York yeah. city. I think it was them at 50, 55 bar, just two drum sets. I don't think they were the only ones on the gig. I think it was like a breakdown. Maybe they did in the middle of the set where they were just like kind of playing with the snares off with their fingers and scratching the bottoms of the snares but not free, like super funky. Like they were like playing like it was like bongos or something. And I, I remember watching that thinking, these guys got it. They totally get it. They're like grooving together and they're listening to one another and they're playing off one another. It sounded so good and and totally different, but that's what they were doing. And then they get it. Like you, you can set two drum sets up together and they can totally intertwine mm-hmm. and become this super cool rhythmic rhythmic section, you know? Uh, I got to look up that video again because I remember seeing that thinking, wow, these guys sound awesome together. Well, I was going to ask because um, like so it is online because like Weiss is like I don't I don't I feel like I don't really know what his deal is because he's like a tabla guy who is a drum kit guy. And I feel like he's just like he's like um, ahead of me in that way. And then Ari Honig is like uh, what I know him as like just this like master of time. Yeah. Um, so to, to hear the two of them play together, um, yeah. Yeah, they're both fantastic. They're yeah. both, and they sound totally different. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, they're they're great. And uh, there's just, you know, New York is, you know, chock full of fantastic drummers that we might not, not even know their names, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. They're, um, but that happens everywhere. I mean, that's, a, that's another thing I think about a lot is, like, there are great drummers everywhere. Like I can go to like Denmark and go to some bar and I walk in, I'm like, who is this guy? He's the best guy I've heard like all year. Who is this right. guy? You know, you can go, it's like, it's weird to think that only like the guys in the modern drummer readers poll are the only drummers in the world. It's like, yeah. they are the smallest slice of what's out there. There are guys all over the globe slaying it who are masterfully playing the drums and we just don't know who they are. Yeah, and for different reasons, like it might be the styles of music. It might be that they're so deep into the craft they just don't care about. Yeah, their needs or regionally, there. regionally yep. it doesn't reach a lot of language wise. It doesn't reach a lot of people. Like yeah. who knows? There might be a guy in like I don't know, like Istanbul, who is. I mean, yeah, Istanbul. I went to a a party once there, and there was just like three dudes playing top, not not tablas, uh, doombecks, and they were. I mean, my jaw was on the floor. I was like, oh, my God. I ran up to the guy at, at, at this party and said, I need to take a lesson with you. He didn't even speak English. I'm like, I need to take a lesson with you. This is ridiculous what you're doing. Who are you? You know, just some dude. Did you like, take a was, lesson? No. I don't <laughs> think he understood what I was trying to say. But I was just like, I mean, that kind of thing. I was just, just I was bursting with joy. Just like, yeah. who is this guy? This is insane. Oh man, I love it. Um, I just I like I love your your uh, joy and un, unbridled enthusiasm for. It's like you know the question. I mean the thing the thing that I was asking earlier, describing your practice routine. It's like what what motivates you, but you can tell it's just like it is pure passion, excitement, um, yeah, and I mean, that's what I it's got to be, I, I right? Think, yeah, I mean I I'm not like all sunshine and rainbows. I can be as dark as the next guy. Oh, but, who is? Yeah, but like I. I understand that. I understand mm-hmm. that that's what life is, the ebb and the flow, you know, and I, I go with that. Sometimes I get super down on myself. So I'm not like just Mr. Self-help, like marching down the street <laughs> all day long. You know, I get super dark and I, I'm like, you know, what's going on with this world or what's going on with my life? Oh, I mean, that's easy with- to do right now. Yeah, um, but, but I have a good grasp of that because I know yeah. that's there. I know that's going to happen. I know it's going to happen over and over again. I'm not imagining Everything's going to be just, you know, fine and dandy day in and day out all the time. So I think it's more like I'm accepting 
I'm accepting the mood swings and I'm accepting the, the way that's going to be. And that helps me keep a, a lighter attitude more often, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it also it's, helps me have good relations with my other friends too. Cause all my other friends are doing the same thing. You know, you talk to another drummer and he's just on top of the world. You talk to another drummer and he's just ready to jump off a bridge and you're, <laughs> you're able you're able to be there for both of them, you know, like to say, oh, man, I hear you. Or, yeah, man, I hear you. And like you can all like all the swings in people's careers and their emotions, you can kind of help, you know, uh, hold on to them a little bit and, and level them out. You know? Yeah. And you can only really relate if you get it. Like you can only really empathize if you've been there to some degree. I mean, nobody ever like truly understands somebody else's um, circumstance, but. Um, I know it, it's it's like it's such a, a cool thing about music too. Like just in the sense of like I've got some songwriter friends um, who be you know like man my songs are so depressing, um, but it is an acceptable way to publicly like deal with those kinds of feelings that we all have. You know, mm -hmm. it would be weird, yeah, if like you were the only person who's ever felt that and you like, <laughs> felt, you know, like get this compulsion to get up on stage and like, yeah, then maybe you would get people like asking if you're OK. And yeah. I think you can push it far enough and that will happen. But um, it is also like the kind of beautiful thing about it is that you can kind of push it in that direction and uh, become vulnerable or personal uh, or sensitive and it is acceptable, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it, in a way that if you were just like talking into a microphone about like these like feelings, like it would people would get uncomfortable and they would leave. Yeah. Uh, but there's also an issue. With, there's also a slight issue with the opposite uh, effect of if you're just Mr. Happy Go Lucky 100 percent of the time, that's also annoying. Like, oh, yeah. Dude, <laughs> the life isn't that happy. You know, well, and you nobody know, stop, believes stop it, right? asking me to look at the bright side all the time. You know, yeah. I don't want to look at the bright side today, you know, so I, I don't want to portray myself, even though I'm, I, I do come across as a positive guy. Mm -hmm. I am not like I believe in positivity 100 percent of the time. I'm like, no, no, no. Let's get in touch with your darkness, too. <laughs> yeah, that is important. That's an important thing to, to you know, understand and, and realize and get to know. What are 10 things you hate? 10 things I hate. <laughs> Narrow it down to 10. You don't have to answer either. It's oh, just okay. like kind of a, have you ever seen the Calvin and Hobbes comic where uh, Calvin's starting to write a list and it's a million things I hate. And then <laughs> Hobbes comes along, he goes, uh, what about excessively negative people? He goes, yeah, that's a good one. And then he like <laughs> realizes he's been had. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a good. Yeah. People who make lists. I hate them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people th feel the need to categorize everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's two kinds of people I hate. People who categorize things and <laughs> people who make lists. Yeah, people yeah. who can't be bothered. Um, all right. Yeah, cool. I should jump off. Um, cool. So much appreciated, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, great talking to you. I feel cool. like... We should do a podcast sometime. Oh, hey, you know what? It's it um, great, chat great chatting with you, but... Yeah. <laughs> We should record this sometime. We should, we should let people in on this. Boom. There you go. Drummers, Merry Christmas. Or uh, whatever you celebrate, even if it's just getting drunk for a week at the end of the year. Um, I hope you'll get to see some people that you like. Maybe people you even love. Um, hard to say what's going to happen around here. We had uh, the Atlantic bubble. It burst. If you don't know what that is. Um, you could Google it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter to your life. Why are you listening to me? <laughs> Thank you so much to Brendan Buckley for being here. Seriously, what a treat. Thanks to Micah Brown for the audio work. It makes this whole thing much more sustainable. Thanks to Wendy Ford for finding me online and hooking me up with some cool guests. Thanks to you for listening. Thanks to everybody who's been on the show this season or ever really. The last two seasons, man, I've been, I've been, uh, reposting content now that I'm uh, I'm three seasons deep. There's some real gems from throughout the show. Anyhow, learndrums.ca for all of your uh, archives of this stuff, which the, re the reason the show and the Instagram and website have two different names is that um, I think as I may have mentioned, my original idea was just to like hustle drum lessons so I wouldn't have to get a job. Anyhow, here we are. 
Life remains interesting. I hope 2020 has uh, been good to you at least some of the time. Um, you should seriously, if you're a drummer, if you're interested in drumming, if you've made it this far and you're not interested in drumming, um, I'm confused. But anyhow, the drummer plus drummer that he does is really awesome. It's like such a nice thing every time I see it pop up on my feed. Brennan Buckley on Insta Instagram. Ingristar. I had a friend's mom thought it was called Ingristar. Um, check him out on YouTube. Please do not heckle him on YouTube. He's got a. He's such a good drummer, man. He's got like a ton of cool videos. All right, we're we're near the three hour mark. Time for us all to go home. One thing I forgot to mention: I'm on the East Coast. Brennan's on the West Coast. So it was 2 a.m. by the time we finished doing this. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you in 2021. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. You don't want to miss anything. You don't want to miss a thing. Man, I saw Aerosmith and they're like, bet you didn't think we were going to play this song. What a way to go out. Bye, buddies.